struggle to achieve thorough photo detector cells in wide beam lighters is still limited, thus providing low red resolution. And lastly, to achieve full synth coverage with the sensors, multiple units are required, which might offset the cost benefits. Here we show a quick demo of flash lighter data, and as a freebie, it's projection onto a panoramic camera. The nice thing here is that there's virtually no projection error due to the rolling shutter, since both camera and lighter are operating with the same time. Another design, which aims at marrying the best of both mechanical and solid-state lighters, uses microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS for short. Uh, they control a mirror that directs the laser beam onto the desired angles. This is technically a quasi-solid-state system, in the sense that there is still a mechanical actuation, but it's at the micro scale and the lasers and optics are static. An interesting application this enables is custom scanning patterns by, for example, spending more cycles scanning the region directly ahead and fewer on the sides, which provides a denser point cloud in the region of interest. A point of consideration here is that the tiny mirror limits how much energy can be used in the laser beam, and so to achieve longer ranges, the laser frequency becomes a key factor. Here we have a video showing data from such a sensor. Uh, it's worth noting that because the sensor is essentially operating on a plane, since there are no major moving parts, the wide horizontal coverage is achieved by having multiple sensors, as we can see here. The light of the sensor we covered so far typically use the post amplitude modulated laser, and so range is simply defined by the time of flight of the pulse. However, a different approach relies on using a continuous frequency modulated laser, and in this case, the range is determined by comparing the frequency shift between two coherent waves one from the internal oscillator and another from the reflected wave. An interesting side effect of frequency modulation is that you can simultaneously measure radial distance and velocity because of the Doppler effect. However, this comes with its own set of challenges. Firstly, we want to estimate the position and velocity accurately, but because both will affect frequency, we need to come up with strategies to disentangle the effects. Second, the frequency comparison between the source and reflected waves is only possible if they stay coherent which potentially limits the range of these sliders as a function of the coherence length of the wave. Because of these added complexities, FMCW lighters are still at a lower technical rate at this level, as well as commercial availability. Here we have example data, and of particular interest is the upper half, which shows the detected radio velocity and gives nice features on the moving actors in the scene. Radar is very similar to lighter, but instead of lasers, it uses radio waves. It works by using an antenna to emit a low-frequency wave and capture its reflections. By using the angle and time dot of the return, a 3D position will be established. Uh, most of you will be very familiar with this when, as a child, you would shout at a cliff and then hear echoes from different places. Um, like before, we have the benefit here that by observing the change in frequency between emitted and received wave, uh, we can inform the radio velocity of the target by the Doppler effect. We're also able to manipulate the emitted wave for more spread or range, which gives us operation modes for near or long range. Um, by using lower frequency waves, radar is also able to penetrate through rain, snow, and fog, making it more robust to weather. But this can also be problematic, as radar will also be able to penetrate through obstacles if they're small enough. They will also generally produce fewer points in comparison to lighter, but this varies considerably from model to model. And lastly, because of how waves propagate in space, the same object might create ghost detections due to multi-path returns. Uh, this happens when you have uh, multiple reflections from the original signal before reaching the antenna. And this is analogous to the bottle example from LiDAR. Um, ultrasounds are a much cheaper and simpler version of the previous sensors. In this case, the emitter sends an ultrasound wave with a specific frequency, and a microphone waits for reflections of this frequency. The delay defines the minimal distance to the nearest obstacle. This essentially defines a semi-sphere of empty space as opposed to a point in neither or radar. The benefits of the sensor is that it's very cheap and already available in most consumer vehicles. Uh, it's also very effective at near range where just knowing that there is something close to the vehicle regardless of its very precise position is already actionable information. On the other hand, just knowing the sphere of empty space doesn't really give you much geometry about the environment. Um, a little note here is that by using a network of ultrasounds, we can triangulate the position of returns when a chirp from one emitter is heard in a neighboring receiver. Uh, this is called the cross echo. We will show this later. But in either case, it will only measure the nearest obstacle. 
So it gives you a very coarse understanding of the scene, and it's not enough to identify individual instances of objects if there are multiple ones. Lastly, it's also a sensor that tends to be noisy, given all the background sound around the vehicle, especially at higher speeds. In this video, we show a few of the sensor modalities we discussed before. The fine points are the light returns called from reflectors, the bold points are radar returns, with an indication for radio velocity, the red arcs are the ultrasound echoes, and the blue arcs are the cross echoes. We consider as pedestrians approach the vehicle, fewer LiDAR points are produced, but the rider appropriately detect detects the presence and velocity, paired with strong ultrasound signals. We also have reliable measures to the vehicles in front and behind of us. Cameras are probably the most fun, popular sensor here. We have them in our phones and can immediately relate to the sensing modality with our eyes. They are based on a matrix of photosensitive cells that filter for a specific color band, typically red, green, and blue at a ratio of two green cells for each red and blue cell, and this proportion is designed to mimic human perception. The raw information is converted to RGB pixels using a process called debayering, which interpolates the RGB value of each pixel from the raw sensor readings of each color. The benefits of this sensor is that by directly perceiving colors, we can infer the texture and materials of the sense, which is very informative for detecting objects. They're also generally cheap, providing high resolution data and are vastly available, which means that there is a rich body of literature on how to effectively use the data. They provide high frame rates, typically anywhere from 30 to 120 frames per second, and each frame is an instant snapshot of the scene, as opposed to a gradual scan, as is the case for spinning lighters. We can also use lenses to see a very wide with fish eyes or very far with telescopes and leveraging a mix of these is key for visual coverage. On the con side, the image is effectively just a plane, so there's no explicit depth information. With a well-calibrated system, we can infer the angles of the rays, but to get 3D points, we would need a stereo setup, which is more challenging. Because cameras are, in essence, ambient light sensors, they entirely rely on external illumination, and thus does less effective at night or in the dark. Furthermore, the interaction of the light with the lenses may also create artifacts, such as distortion, which is specially pronounced in fish eyes, vignette, flare, and so on. To tackle the issue of lighting, some camera sensors are designed to operate using the infrared spectrum instead. This can be either done actively by illuminating the scene with an infrared light, which essentially amounts to an unobtrusive flash, or passively by using the natural emission of infrared due to the heat of bodies. These are sometimes referred to as thermal cameras and are generally the more relevant ones for self-driving. As such, these cameras have little reliance on ambient light and work just as well as the dark. The capture of passive, passive IR cameras also shows the heat of bodies and so it's very useful in detecting limby actors such as pedestrians or animals. On the limitation side, active infrared cameras have very limited range as they need to provide the lighting themselves and naturally there is a limit to how, how much energy you can provide. And conversely, passive infrared cameras are expensive because they require special materials to make sensors that are very sensitive to this infrared, while not being subject to the black body radiation of the sensor itself uh, for warming up to two years. Uh, so here's a two for one. We have RGB camera data and passive infrared here. And this nicely illustrates the points we talked about and how it's virtually unaffected by ambient light and it's particularly useful in detecting living things or operating machinery, since they're obvious sources of infrared. Microphones are the oldest sensor here, but a very useful one. In essence, they work by converting the air vibrations from sound into electric signals. There are two main types of microphones. Inductive, in which the air vibrations are captured by a diaphragm that then moves a coil around the magnet, inducing an electric current in the process. And there are capacitive microphones, in which the diaphragm moves the charge capacitor plate, and so there is a discharge of current when pushed closer to the opposite plate. And in that case, both the amplitude and frequency of the sound are extracted, which allows us to discern the nature and how loud it is. If we have an array of microphones, we can also find the direction of the sound source through a process called beamforming. This is analogous to stereo in vision, and works by finding correspondences in the signals across microphones and the time deltas in each one, which allows us to triangulate the source of the sound since we know the speed at which it travels and the distance between the individual microphones. So microphones are a very interesting sensing modality. 
It gives us an early alert to Cyrus or honking, for instance, even before the vehicle is visible from other sensors. There's also interesting research directions in using background noise signatures as a way to bootstrap localization. And lastly, microphones are very cheap. On the con side, much like ultrasounds, microphones will be affected by the noise from the vehicle itself, the, wind at the wind at high speeds, and so on. And furthermore, even though we can extract some geometry with beamforming, it's still very coarse and prone to acoustic artifacts. Here we show an application of the beamforming technique. While we don't hear the actual microphone data, we can see the frequencies here and how they shift between the microphones can be used to accurately locate the source of the sound, which is a pretty interesting application. Overall, we hope that a key takeaway from this tutorial is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for autonomous driving sensors, and each has its own set of pros and cons. The key for robust and not safe autonomy lies in being cognizant of these trade-offs and designing hardware and software solutions that leverage the strength of its sensors by mitigating its shortcomings, as well as having redundancies. Thank you. Cool. So now we'll do a Q&A session in five minutes. We have uh, Davi and Andre online. Thanks, Eva. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to round up some of the questions that are, there's one on the Slido. So there's, a, there's multiple places where people can ask questions. I guess here, the most convenient one is in the Zoom chat, but we also have a Slido that's linked on the website, uh, as well as you can ask questions in the in the YouTube chat. So the YouTube chat is currently for the live stream empty. There's one question on Slido currently, whether which asks, uh, is your tutorial going to be recorded and available somewhere on the CVPR uh, 2021 website? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's going to be the recording of the YouTube live stream. Um, I think that's going to miss a little bit in the beginning, but we will update individual, like the individual session videos, like we did on the 2020 website which is also linked on the 2021 website. Uh, we're gonna have individual videos for each session posted after CVPR. Um, and I think that answers uh, one of the questions in Zoom chat as well. And then for the calibration question, do you wanna take this, Davi? In Zoom. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, can you please comment about sensor calibration and how to handle drifts in calibration? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Just to make sure that I'm yes, actually yes. alive. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's a, a great question. So usually the way that this is set up is that we have some sort of like offline calibration to get things properly done like the one time, but obviously this doesn't account for drift. Um, so yeah, there's like a huge body of literature on this. Um, so what comes to mind right now, for example, is you can do the slam, for instance. Um, so like if you have your set of cameras, uh, you can find features that overlap between them and use those um, as well as like structure from motion to adjust the, for a drift you might have in calibration. Um, but yeah, like overall, it's like a, a very open-ended research question. And there's like a lot of work in figuring out ways to do this reliably online um, to like compensate for your offline calibration. But it can be costly and it doesn't account for this kind of like online errors that you might have. That's cool. good. Um, next uh, the next question is, like, what are some common calibration tools popular in the self-driving car industry? Uh, I guess I could, I could talk about this for camera calibration. Uh, I think there's not a one size fits all solution uh, in my experience for like basic stuff the toolkits that come for example with the open cv work quite well but if you want to kind of scale it up to like more complex for example camera rigs and com like specific infrastructure and stuff like this like physical infrastructure i mean then i think it it's quite common to build your own sort of calibration pipeline from scratch. Like basically you build like, you you often have to build like your physical sort of uh, set of calibration targets, uh, maybe even like a, like a big turntable for the vehicle, or maybe you can move the, the 
targets themselves. And then you basically build like you use some sort of optimization framework like series or some other solver. And you use that to kind of solve for your intrinsics and extrinsics using like a sort of hand rolled solution. Uh, and then the next question is, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and then the next question is how much data we need to process quickly when taking all of these sensors into account that it's a lot of data. So uh, it's, yeah, a lot of, like there's a huge part of sort of the, the substrate of self-driving that's maybe not covered in a lot of detail in this tutorial, but it's extremely important, which is sort of the hard, like the software infrastructure, like the runtime sort of harness. Uh, but there's a lot of data. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but you can think of, you know, there you have something like seven full HD cameras, uh, like millions of LiDAR points per second. And uh, all of this stuff kind of adds up. So you need to make, to have a lot of, often pre-processing that happens in like either the camera hardware or like super optimized code before the stuff even gets to your model. And just to add to that, we're gonna have discussions later on how the latency of this affects the model. Uh, so yeah, just stay tuned for the next tutorial sessions. Thanks. And I think we're out of time. The last question is uh, very interesting. Uh, which is about the role of sensors in public infrastructure, like traffic cameras and lidars. Uh, we haven't like we haven't really covered that part in the tutorial, and I think it's an open area of research. But uh, I, I personally don't know that much about leveraging infrastructure sensors in in, in self driving. But I'm sure that as more sensors get attached to this infrastructure, they become a very valuable asset. Yeah, and I, I think when we get to the session on V2V communication, there's yeah, some overlap say. in some of the work there. Yeah, this okay, V2V cool. and V2X, we'll, we're going to cover that. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks, Andre. Thanks, Davi. Uh, okay. We can go ahead and start with the next session on perception. Hello, everyone. My name is Bing Yang, a research scientist at Wabi. In this session, I'll provide an overview on works that tackle 3D perception for self-driving. The problem that we are trying to solve here is the following. Given multiple sources of sensor inputs, for example, LiDAR, camera, radar, as well as high definition maps, how can we design a system that jointly utilizes these information sources and efficiently detects surrounding traffic actors in an open world environment? This problem has the following key challenges that need to, need to be addressed. First of all, the fundamental task we are doing is 3D object detection. So the commonly used metric is a precision recall curve at different localization criteria, usually defined by the intersection over union of two bounding boxes. Secondly, we have multiple sources of sensor inputs for LiDAR, camera, radar, and HD maps. So we need to do sensor fusion in our perception system. Thirdly, we need to make a design choice for the specific kind of output representations the model reasoned about. Commonly used ones are bounding boxes, pixel-wise masks, or thin level occupancy grids. In addition, the efficiency of the perception system matters for driving safely, as it needs to run in real time. We will discuss ways to speed up computation using sparse kernels and how we can design latency-aware perception models. Finally, we are dealing with an open-world environment. And to ensure safety, the perception system should be able to recognize unknown objects on the road. Given the aforementioned problem definition and challenges, we will review recent works from the following aspects. We will begin with LiDAR-based perception algorithm. In particular, we will discuss different LiDAR point cloud representations, how to exploit zero sparsity to speed up computation, and the predominant oh, okay. detection frameworks that currently exist. We will then move on to the approaches that perform 3D perception using a more affordable sensor, cameras. Afterwards, we will talk about sensor fusion techniques that jointly process LiDAR and camera data as well as radar data. Apart from multiple sensors, we can also exploit prior knowledge like high definition maps to improve the system robustness. 
HD maps are built for various purposes in practical self-driving systems. And here, we discuss the use of HD maps in the context of 3D perception mainly. While most of perception algorithms focus on a few predefined object categories of interest, it's also critical to driving safety that we recognize unknown objects on the road, like animals and garbage that interfere with our driving routes. We therefore briefly discuss algorithms that address this open set perception task. Lastly, for a real world application, just having great performance at the task at hand is not enough because practical considerations such as latency matters. Therefore, we will also briefly discuss metrics and models that take into account of latency. Well, in this session, we try to cover the following commonly used sensor modalities for 3D perception. We'd like to emphasize that there exist other sensors for this task as well, like ultrasonics. Please see session two for a more comprehensive review of hardware for self-driving. We first revisit LiDAR-based approaches. Due to its accurate 3D measurements, LiDAR is often used as the primary sensor for self-driving vehicles. However, dealing with LiDAR point clouds data itself is a non-trivial task due to computation constraints, less structured data format, and a dramatically varying sparsity. Different representations have been proposed to process LiDAR point clouds, and they can be roughly categorized into two types, voxel-based and point-based. Voxel-based representations discretize the point clouds into uniform grid for easier data processing. These grids can live in the original 3D space or in a 2D space that's projected from 3D. Two commonly used 2D projections are the range view projection and the bird eye view projection. On the other hand, a point-based representation keeps the naive irregular structure of point clouds free from discretization errors. One of the most commonly used representation for point clouds is 3D voxels, which discretize the point clouds into uniform 3D volumetric grids. Different voxel representations can be applied from simple ones like occupancy value to more complex point features that are learned from data. 3D voxels preserve the 3D metric space and enable effective multi-scale feature extraction with 3D convolutions. However, its computation and the memory footprint grows cubically, cubically with regard to detection range and voxel resolution. This creates a trade-off between accuracy and efficiency, since the long detection ranges and the fine-grained voxel resolutions to capture the detail of small objects like pedestrians are necessary to build robust perception systems. What's more, the 3D voxels themselves are very sparse for LiDAR point clouds, which means that a large proportion of computation is wasted on empty locations. While 3D voxels are very sparse, the 2D range view projection is a much denser and more compact representation of LiDAR point clouds. This projection works by mapping laser beams in horizontal and vertical directions to a 2D image plane defined by the LiDAR field of view in azimuths and elevation angles. The resolutions in azimuths and elevation are usually set according to the LiDAR specification. In other words, one can understand the 2D range view projection as a panorama image for LiDAR. Commonly used pixel representations are point height, range, and occupancy. Range view projections can be efficiently processed by 2D convolutions, and they also preserve full range information without range cutoff, as in 3D voxels. However, it is more difficult to incorporate priors here due to the metric space distortion, and the neighborhoods in the range view are not the true ones, which makes 3D learning less straightforward. Another 2D representation is bird eye view projection which works similarly to 3D voxels, but consolidates height information as a BEV voxel feature. These BEV voxel features can be either hand-designed, such as the Texas at discrete height, height slices, or learnable features or points within the BEV pillar. 
EV representation shares the same advantages as 3D voxels in that 3D metric space is preserved, with additional benefit that the spatial dimension of feature maps is reduced from 3 to 2, leading to more efficient inference. Note that this is a reasonable assumption as planning is performed on the same ground. However, the computation and the memory costs still grow quadratically with regard to voxel resolution and the detection range. Later, we'll discuss techniques that exploit sparsity to speed up computation. While, preserved, while previously introduced plantations all discretize their irregular point clouds into regular 2D or 3D grids, we can also use its raw representation as an unordered set of 3D points where 3D coordinates are used as a point feature. We then apply point-based neural networks for feature learning. Unlike grid-based representations, the point set representation doesn't have discretization error as precise point locations are preserved. As a result, this often leads to better object localization precision. The drawback of this representation mainly lies in its point-wise feature learning. In particular, this representation creates significant computation overhead from irregular memory access and dynamic kernel computation. What's more, multi-scale features are desired for object detection, and this is realized by key point sampling or point-wise feature learning. However, different key point subsampling strategies can affect the final performance a lot, due in part to the dramatically varying point density of LiDAR data. So far, we've reviewed the four different representations for LiDAR point clouds, two of which are very sparse, the 3D voxels and the BEV projections. A natural question arises, can we exploit the data sparsity to speed up computation? The answer is yes. We can use sparse convolutions to avoid wasting computation on empty locations. Sparse convolution works by doing computation on valid locations only and the valid lo convolution is realized via the into column algorithm. The valid locations are stored as a looked up table beforehand so that the sparsity pattern doesn't change as we stack more convolution layers. While sparse convolutions can generalize very well, it produces limited speed up in the 2D case as the image to column algorithm doesn't run as fast as a well-optimized 2D dense convolution kernel. To address this performance issue, sparse block convolution is proposed. Instead of operating on original valid locations, it first approximates the sparsity mask with a blockwise mask. And there is a faster Winograd algorithm for dense convolution on all blocks. The weakness of the approach is the introduction of a tiling step, which is unsuitable for very scattered sparsity patterns. However, in the case of self-driving, where we care more about on-road perception, the drivable region can serve as the sparsity mask and it can be well approximated by blocks. Here we show a video where we apply sparse block convolutions to speed up bird eye view vehicle detection. On the top are the results of the original dense BEV detector, which detects vehicles within 17 meters range. On the bottom left, we show the results that exploit the drivable region as a sparsity mask, where we can achieve about two times speed up. On the bottom right, we show results that exploit the sparser mask produced by a segmentation network, where we can achieve even more speed up. It's also worth noting that the speed up is achieved without sacrificing detection accuracy. In practice, we observe less than a 1% drop in average precision. So far, we have discussed the various point cloud representations, as well as how to build efficient feature extractors on top. Now we briefly discuss different design designs of the detection framework. In the context of 3D object detection, there exist the two major frames, which are one-stage framework and two-stage framework. While one-stage detectors produce pixel-wise object estimates through a single forward pass of a conventional neural network, two-stage detectors decompose the task into two steps. First, generate object proposals in a fully conventional way, and then refine the proposals 
based on region-specific features. We first review the one-state 3D object detectors, which produce dense 3D object detection outputs in terms of box information and class probabilities from the last layer of a component. For 3D box estimation, there are two ways to do this. One way is to directly regress the 3D size and orientation of a bounding box at each pixel of the output feature map. This means that we believe the network capacity is large enough to capture the variations in object shapes. Another solution is to resort to a set of predefined anchors or prototypical object shapes. For each object, for each output pixel, the model predicts the probability for each anchor as well as the residual information with regard to that anchor shape. As a result, the issue of large object shape variance is remedied to some extent. One-stage detectors typically have real-time inference speed and have fewer hyperparameters to tune in general. However, they suffer from imprecise object localization, as in many cases, we are estimating the object boundary from the center pixel alone. Two-stage 3D object detectors, in contrast, introduce the concept of region feature pooling to further refine the initial object estimations. While the first stage is almost the same as a one-stage detector, the second stage takes high confidence detections from the first stage and extracts region of interest features for box refinement. In practice, we can add even more stages afterwards for more iterations of ref refinement. Two stage detectors have achieved the state of the art detection accuracy on many public benchmarks, showing advantages over one stage detectors, especially in terms of precise object localization. However, this higher accuracy is achieved at the cost of slower inference and more hyperparameters. So far, we've reviewed the LiDAR-based approaches for 3D perception, covering different representations, efficient feature computation, and different detection frameworks. Next, we'll talk about camera-based approach for 3D perception. Cameras are appealing in that they are much cheaper than LiDAR provide texture information that LiDAR doesn't have and capture more fine details. The main issue with cameras is that we lose depth information, which is important for 3D perception. In order to reason about 3D from the 2D image space, we need to lift the information from 2D space to 3D space. This can happen at three different places, input, feature map, and output. We first look at methods that lift to 3D at the output level, which directly predicts 3D bounding boxes from 2D pixel features. To bridge the gap between 2D features and 3D targets, several techniques have been proposed. From the perspective of feature learning, one can add 3D LiDAR data as input during training if that's available, and regularize the 2D image features to be close to the 3D LiDAR features in the feature space. At test time, we do not use the 3D LiDAR data as input. From the perspective of output parameterization, instead of directly predicting the 3D box, one can predict the object key, key points in 2D and solve for 3D box via template matching as shown in the figure. This type of approach can be considered as a simple extension of existing 2D detectors with a different output target. However, the performance is, is usually unsatisfactory when measured in 3D space. Now we look at methods that lift to 3D at the input level, also known as pseudo LiDAR. These approaches first perform pixel-wise depth estimation, and then convert the image pixels with estimated depths to 3D space following the camera parameters. Then an off-the-shelf point cloud-based 3D detector can be applied to the pseudo LiDAR point cloud. In these models, the depths can be inferred from monocular camera, stereo cameras, or by self-supervision from multiple cal calibrated cameras or video sequences. Studio LiDAR-based approaches achieve state-of-the-art results in camera-based 3D perception at the cost of an additional depth model. Instead of lifting to 3D as an input or output level, we can alternatively lift to 3D as a feature level in order to achieve a better trade-off between exploitation and computation. Specifically, a 2D carbonate is first applied on the camera image 
to extract 2D image features. The pixels in the 2D feature map are then converted to 3D space as a 3D point or as a ray, depending on whether the depth is known or not. After feature map transformation, the resulting 3D feature map is then used to output 3D detections. Since the features lie in 3D space, they typically produce better 3D geometry. Another advantage is that the 2D 3D feature transformation only requires the camera parameters and can work even without depth estimation. The main weakness of this kind of approach also lies in the feature transformation. When depth is unknown, the one-to-many mapping brings ambiguity in the resulting 3D feature maps. When depth is known, errors in depth estimation would also lead to misaligned 3D features. So far, we've gone through perception algorithms that rely on either LiDAR or cameras. Now we see how we can combine LiDAR and cameras together for more robust perception. Broadly speaking, there are two main pipelines for LiDAR and camera fusion, the cascade pipeline and the parallel pipeline. For the parallel pipeline, we further compare fusion mechanisms at different levels. For the cascade fusion approach, a two-stage model is built. The first stage produces 2D detections from the camera image and converts these 2D volume boxes into 3D frustums given calibrated camera and LiDAR sensors. The second stage then performs 3D object localization given LiDAR points within each frustum. This approach can take advantage of mature 2D detectors, which provide high quality object proposals. Also, in the 3D space, the model only needs to solve the localization task instead of joint recognition and localization. However, due to its cascading nature, this approach cannot recover from errors made in the first stage. For example, if an object is missed by the 2D detector, it will not be able to recover by the second stage. Furthermore, 3D localization within frustums can be difficult for occluded objects. Now let's look, take a look at the more widely used parallel pipeline for sensor fusion. We first review output fusion, which is adopted by many systems in industry. In these approaches, 3D perception is run on each sensor modality individually, and their perception results are fused together at the tracking level. Output fusion methods embody the spirit of a modular design and therefore achieve redundant sensitivity. However, each object estimate is typically more unreliable as it comes from a single sensor and the rule-based fusion is also error-prone. In contrast to output fusion that combines different sensor modalities at the most abstract object track level, input fusion combines information at the raw sensory data level. It works by converting different sensor modalities into a unified space and then combining them together. In the case of LiDAR and camera fusion, the unified space is said to be the 3D space as we care about 3D perception. To find a one-to-one -one mapping between LiDAR points and image pixels, we project each LiDAR point onto the image plane. If the point falls within the image, then the corresponding pixel is matched with the LiDAR points. Otherwise, the LiDAR point has no match. We then append pixel features like RGB or predicted semantic label to its associated LiDAR point. The enhanced LiDAR point clouds are fed into an off-the-shelf LiDAR-based model. Compared with output fusion, these methods provide denser fusion of raw sensory data. However, they don't exploit camera information fully as it's represented in a primitive and low-dimensional format. They are also sensitive to unexpected calibration errors between sensors. A more promising direction for sensor fusion is to fuse at the feature level. Here we can perform either coarse RY-wise feature fusion or dense pixel-wise feature fusion. For RY fusion, we project the same object RY to 2D and 3D respectively and combine their features together. This is usually performed as an RY pooling layer within a two-stage object detection framework. For pixel-wise fusion, the most straightforward implementation is to fuse pixel features with point features. The pixel to point correspondence 
can be found by projecting LiDAR points to the image plane. However, since LiDAR points are sparse in 3D, only occupied locations get complementary information from the camera image. To address this, we can add a learnable interpolation layer that learns to interpolate the image features at unoccupied voxels from image features at occupied voxels. The interpolation layer can be realized with continuous convolution, which is invariant to the number of neighbors and works in continuous space. After feature interpolation, we achieve a dense pixel to voxel fusion. Feature level fusion fully exploits complementary information at multiple scales and therefore is more robust to small calibration errors. However, as we need to perform feature extraction on each sensor modality first, this approach also brings more computation cost. We've reviewed the sensor fusion of LiDAR and camera. Now let's look at the radar and see how it can be used in conjunction with other sensors. Since, LiDAR is a 3D since radar is a 3D sensor, we will first look at how its 3D geometry information can be exploited. This usually happens in the setting of radar plus camera, which is a common setting for ADAS. In this setting, radar provides sparse but reliable 3D depth information for images. Many previously mentioned fusion methods can be adopted here, where we simply treat radar data as sparse point clouds. However, the overall performance under this setting is typically not as good as LiDAR-based systems due to two reasons. First, radar radio waves cannot achieve the same ranging precision as laser light. Second, the radar measurements are sparser compared with LiDAR. Apart from the 3D geometry information, what makes radar a necessity in most self-driving sensor kits is its real-time and direct velocity measurement. Here we discuss two approaches to exploit the velocity information in the setting of LiDAR plus radar, which are feature level fusion and output level fusion. At feature level, recent work LiRadNet proposes to rasterize radar observations at the same BV space as LiDAR and apply a separate curve net on it. The resulting radar specific feature maps are then fused with LiDAR and map features at multiple scales. To address the data sparsity issue in radar returns, they propose to densify the radar raster image by linear interpolation voxel features from nearby radar returns. The raster feature encodes both the geometric and the velocity information of radar returns. With feature level fusion of radar information, LiRaNet achieves significant improvements in both object detection and motion forecasting. In terms of output level fusion, the most straightforward way is to perform detection and tracking from LiDAR and radar respectively, and then combine them together as a tracking level. This has the advantage of improving the system robustness with redundancy safety. However, the object state estimation is not necessarily improved as they each come from one sensor modality only. An alternative is to learn object level fusion strategy from data, which first associates radar measurements with object detections, and then exploits velocity information from the radar points to improve the state estimation of associated object detections. Specifically, for each detection, we find its nearby radar points as candidates. We then convert the one-dimensional radio velocity of each radar candidate to a 2D dimension, two dimensional velocity vector following the direction of the detection itself. Lastly, we use a tension mechanism to predict the association weight for each pair of detection candidates and achieve a more robust velocity estimation by a weighted sum of all candidates. Compared with rule based fusion methods, data driven fusion fully exploits information from all radar measurements. So far, we've reviewed 3D perception from three different sensors. In self-driving, there's also a lot of prior knowledge that we can use to improve system robustness. One such example is high-definition maps. HD maps provide two types of prior knowledge, the 3D geometry of the environment and the roadmap semantics. In terms of 3D geometry, 
Many works exploit the ground surface geometry for more robust perception on hilly roads. Specifically, the height of each 3D point is subtracted by the height of the ground so that it becomes invariant to the road slope. The ground surface can be parameterized as either a plane or in arbitrary shape encoded by pixel-wise estimates in bird's eye view, which is more generalizable. You can either build a map offline or query it online, or directly estimate the ground geometry online with RANSAC or neural networks. Apart from geometry, HD maps also contain rich semantic information about the road map. One implementation for this type of information is a raster image, where we rasterize the vector shapes of road elements as well as actor trajectories and they use different colors to encode different semantic meanings, such as lane types, orientation, and motion. A 2D component is then applied for map-specific feature learning, which can later be fused with sensor feature maps in the same BEV space, and the resulting feature can be used for more accurate object detection. The raster representation of HD maps is easier to implement and extend However, they suffer from lossy rendering, limited receptive field, and intensive computation. A more intuitive and native representation is the lane graph, where we preserve the original vector format for lanes as well as trajectories. We then apply a graph neural network to obtain polyline level features and another graph neural network to model interactions between lanes and agents. The link graph representation doesn't have information loss and it can capture larger and more structured receptive fields and is more parameter efficient in feature learning. However, instead of resorting to different colors, now we need to delicately design the node and edge features of the link graph so that they capture the full semantic information contained in the HD maps. Here we give a brief summary of how we can jointly exploit information from multiple sources like sensors and HD maps. We first talk about techniques that perform 3D perception from LiDAR, discuss the different input representations and detection frameworks. We then review methods that perform 3D perception from a much cheaper sensor, cameras. Afterwards, we also discuss different sensor fusion strategies that utilizes LiDAR, camera, radar, and maps information all together in a unified perception system. So far, we've discussed the various 3D perception methods that choose 3D or BV as the output representation. Reasoning about parametric outputs has the advantages of better interpretability, and the output space itself is low dimensional. However, in many cases, this also requires additional post-processing, like object decoding, score thresholding, and the non-maximum suppression. And through these post-processings, it becomes hard for downstream modules to fully capture the uncertainty of each object estimate. In the meantime, there are methods that choose to reason about non-parametric output for perception. These methods typically choose to predict a probabilistic occupancy map in BV space. This has the advantage of building end-to-end -end systems while propagating uncertainty, but at the cost of higher dimensional output space and less interpretability. Next, we briefly introduce three recent works that adopt non-parametric output implementations. The first work we want to introduce is discrete residual flow for probabilistic pedestrian behavior prediction. The model takes as input the raster image of the scene encoding the information of both maps and the past actor trajectories and outputs the probabilistic occupancy grids of pedestrians at current and future time steps. Here, the occupancy grid is a natural fit for pedestrians due to the natural multimodality property in its motion forecast. Another recent work, theory performs multi-model motion forecasting from surround, camera, surround monocular cameras. The model first lifts the image features from 2D space to 3D BEV space with steps estimation, and then reason about perception and motion forecast with instant segmentation masks in BEV. 
To handle the multimodal nature of motion forecast, it uses a conditional variational approach, which parameterizes the present and the future states as diagonal Gaussians. The third work, Lift, Splat, and Shoot, learns VV features from RGB camera rigs and outputs object and map segmentation masks in BEV as a perception output. In addition, their model performs motion planning by sampling trajectories on a jointly learned BEV cost map. Here, the segmentation-based perception output serves as a nice auxiliary task to supervise the learning of the motion planning cost map. So far, we have seen algorithms that focus on a few predefined categories of interest. However, the ability to recognize unknown objects is also critical for safe driving. One way to address this challenge is to explain every point in the LiDAR point cloud. In particular, our goal is to segment everything in the scene and classify it as either one of the known classes or as unknown. Additionally, we also want to recognize stuff such as the road. One approach to tackle this task is shown in the figure below. The main idea behind this model is to project the LiDAR points into a category agnostic embedding space. Then within the embedding space, we can group the points into both known and unknown things and stuff, irrespective of their semantics. After seeing how we can detect unknown objects in general, we now pay attention to how we can detect the motion cues of these unknown instances. Since recognizing object motion of unknown instances is also critical for safety. There are many scenarios where a vehicle may encounter moving instances of real categories, such as a person on a wheelchair passing through the road or a dog running across the street. One method to tackle this problem is self-supervised motion estimation with cross-sensor localization, where we utilize both LiDAR inputs and the camera images to detect the motion of plus agnostic objects after factoring out the ego motion of the vehicle. The ambiguity of motion cues from a single sensor is reduced by encouraging consistency between the scene flow of LiDAR points and the optical flow of camera images. This particular approach can take advantage of an off-the-shelf optical flow estimator trained in an unsupervised way, obtaining the optical flow from two consecutive frames of camera images. At the same time, we can do unsupervised scene flow estimation from the corresponding consecutive frames of LiDAR inputs by simply utilizing a chamfer loss and a smoothness loss together. Thus, we have obtained the optical flow and the scene flow of the same two consecutive frames and we want to encourage the consistency between scene flow and the optical flow. To do so, the method computes object motion by factoring out ego motion from optical flow. The ego motion can be calculated using the ego frame pose, ego vehicle pose change and the first frame of LiDAR point clouds, along with already known information, such as camera intrinsic parameters. The estimated object motion serves two purposes. First, we use a consistency loss between the object motion and the scene flow estimation projected to the image plane. Second, we use the object motion information to reweight the points in the chamfer loss where the moving points are weighted higher. This summarizes the training phase of the method. During inference, as a frame T plus one is not available, the model simply takes past LiDAR frames and produces pillar-wise motion estimation at the final output as shown in the green box. This concludes how we can detect motion cues of unknown objects in the setting of open set perception. So far, we've discussed how we can achieve good accuracy and speed in designing a perception system for self-driving vehicles. However, when applied in real-world applications, the latency of the perception system itself also matters, and it is already very short. Here we show an example of how latency affects our perception system in practice, where the system is not getting the real-time state estimates of the detected actors. This video nicely illustrates the effect of latency in real-world systems. 
where the model produces accurate outputs for each image, the time it takes to do so introduces latency in the system. Therefore, by the time these outputs are ready, they no longer represent the real state of the world. Another work, Strobe, proposes an approach to minimize latency in LiDAR perception by ingesting packets and emitting a stream of detections. By leveraging a spatial memory and efficient operators, the model produces accurate detections while achieving latencies six times lower than fast full sweep detectors. The major difference in this work is that the backbone operates at a packet level for efficiency and therefore minimizes data building efficiency. But because individual packets only provide a fragmented observation of the scene, global context is achieved by iteratively updating a latent spatial representation of the scene that is ma maintained with the memory module. To quantify the advantage of operating at a packet level, a latency-aware detection metric is introduced, as opposed to the typical mean average position metric. The green boxes define the ground truth instead of gray. In doing so, the metric takes into account the data buffering time in order to estimate the quality of the detector. This, with the latency-aware metrics, Strobe achieves significant improvements on three major object classes of a traditional detector that's not aware of model latency. This brings us to the end of this session. To summarize, we discussed how to build a robust 3D perception system by exploiting information from different sources with different sensor fusion strategies. We also talked about different output representations that have been used for perception especially in the case of joint learning with downstream tasks like motion forecasting and motion planning. Typically, we introduce challenges when we deploy the perception system in the real world, such as unknown object recognition and taking into account the system latency. We want to emphasize that there are still many aspects of perception for self-driving that we have not covered due to time limitations. For example, perception from other sensors, such as ultrasonics and many more. Thank you for your watching. Cool. So we'll start the Q and A. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, so first one is. Regarding the point cloud representation, did you try to use low level semantics to improve representation efficiency? For instance, replace points in the ground by a plane equation. Then, or Davi? Uh, maybe I can go first and the sure. available, I, he can uh, add more information. So for me, it's a, more about a question of um, efficiency of storage or efficiency of computation. So you can use, Absolutely, you can use this kind of um, plain level, plain wise plantations to improve your storage efficiency. But in terms of computation, it's an, another, I think, question about, uh, it's a more complex question about how you reason about these plantations and how you still able, are you still able to save computation uh, using this kind of abstract or simpler representations? And does this give your perception system a very strong assumption that there is uh, have a very strong dependency and may, may, may hurt your generalization ability. Cool, thanks. Uh, sorry, I missed one of the earlier questions. Uh, this one is um, based on the slide of on lifting the space at 3D at the input and the sensor cover slide from the previous, uh, oh, I guess the slides are uh, already gone, but. How often are the stereo fisheye cameras used in industry to solve both these problems of coverage and to get the 3D image? I don't see many solutions out there using them. Are there any fundamental problems in using them apart from the lens distortion, which can be undistorted anyways? Yes, yeah. So, so I think 
first of all, if, yeah, fisheye cameras are actually used very widely in the industry, especially on production cars with ADAS functionality. And uh, you ask that, is there any fundamental problems uh, out there because you don't see much papers or solutions, public solutions out there. I don't think there's much fundamental problems because I think the, the kind of lens distortion, there are very mature solutions to solve this. I think one of the reason maybe you didn't see much paper because it's it's not, a, uh, I think it's already a kind of solved problem. And also another solution or more, more, more accessible, more acceptable solution in industry is that uh, we will mount multiple cam multiple lidars on the vehicle to improve the coverage. So actually, we we, we already have a lidar coverage in these narrow range uh, blind spots. So it's maybe a more uh, better solution, but also more expensive. Sorry, one follow-up I think to that question was that that question was specific to stereo fisheye, not just fisheye. Is there any additional uh, comments you want to make about stereo fisheye cameras? I see. Um, so I think I think it's it's not not very very, very much difference because whether it's the dis uh, on distortion or fisheye, or it's uh, a calibration or stereo uh, matching between stereo cameras, those are all kind of, there are many mature algorithms to solve this. And I don't see the reason why there's not much paper is about the fundamental problems. It's more about the interests or, or whether this is a solution that many people use. As I mentioned, many players in the industry, they simply try to solve this problem by mounting more, more lidars. Cool, thanks. And then there's another question, which is, um, which database is being used here to store maps data? Um, I see. So, so there are actually many, many data sets out there with map data, especially uh, whether in the form of geometry or in the form of um, semantic information like raster lanes or vector-wise format lanes. So internally, we have ATT4D previously. And uh, publicly, there are actually data sets like new things, Argoverse, that provides uh, uh, all kinds of uh, map information. Cool, thanks. And then uh, one more question I think we can do is, are, are there any perception systems that are built uh, robust to the loss of any given modality in the field? Um, oh yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think this, is, this, is, uh, this is a problem in terms of um, fusion robustness, I think uh, depends on the algorithm actually. Uh, some algorithms, they are built from, uh, from the motivation or intuition that we need to be able to uh, handle cases well during inference, suddenly one of the modalities will be absent because, for example, because of the, uh, some hardware failure or something like that. This is one solution that you make your robust you can make your fusion uh, uh, mechanism robust. Second solution is that some, or, or I think many systems actually have another redundant system uh, or like a backup system. So if one of the system breaks down, like the LiDAR-based light system breaks down, there will be an, another backup system, for example, camera-based or radar-based, uh, which uh, is, may have weaker performance, but it still have uh, the basic uh, competence and functionality to make your whole autonomy still run. Cool, thanks. I think that's all the questions we can take for now, uh, but we'll move on now to the next session, which is on prediction. Hello everyone. My name is Sergio and I am a research scientist at Wabi. In this talk, my colleague Simon and I will dive deep into the exciting topic of prediction. In a traditional self-driving pipeline, prediction comes after detecting and tracking the objects around the self-driving vehicle. With that information, the goal of the prediction model is to predict the future behavior of those objects as, accurate, as accurately as possible. There are three key challenges in accurately forecasting the future. First, occlusions and sensor noise results in partial observation of the obstacles. In the example, due to the vehicle turning left, we can barely see the vehicle behind and its motion history will be partial. Second, we do not know 
the true intention of the actors. In other words, is the vehicle going to continue through the intersection or turn away? Lastly, navigating traffic is highly interactive. We must take into account how actors influence each other as negotiations, such as the one in the example, can generate distinct future realizations. In this talk, we will first see how prediction was framed in the traditional autonomy pipeline and why we extended it to perform perception and prediction jointly. As for any visual task, it is critical to learn a rich representation of the scene. In the first section, we explored the latest approaches into encoding the past context, the map, and lastly, interactions between traffic participants. Then we switch gears to explore output representations that allow us to perform various types of reasoning. First, we explore how to, exp how to capture uncertainty and multimodality at the actor level. Next, we explain how this is extended to conditional prediction where we explicitly model the self-driving vehicle's influence on other actors. Then we go one level deeper and explain how to reason jointly about all actors in the scene to predict consistent futures. Finally, we cover instance-free representations where all the motion forecasting happens with a without a previous detection stage. To wrap up the talk, we discuss the learning methodologies that tie it all together, along with how we evaluate our models. Let's get into our first block and see how we can improve on the traditional autonomy pipeline. The simplest method to try to tackle the prediction problem is to unroll the tracker state with a kinematic model such as the constant velocity or constant turn rate and acceleration. This allows us to incorporate prior knowledge about typical behavior and physics, but the strong assumptions mean we cannot capture the diversity of the real world. As we can see in the image, a constant velocity model does fairly well for most cases, but fails in those that behave more diversely. Another option is to perform maneuver-based prediction. This is a two-step method. First, the intent of an actor is classified based on handcrafted features, and then a fixed set of prototypes is predicted for each intent using classical approaches such as particle filtering. In the example, we can see two intents, lane changing left or staying in the lane, each with multiple trajectory simulations. There are several downsides with this traditional pipeline. First, each module embeds strong assumptions since they have handcrafted logic. When putting the autonomy system together, this ends up being overly complex and hard to trace. Second, prediction relies on accurate information from upstream modules such as tracking. However, in practice, the scenarios are complex and the tracks are not perfect, leaving prediction to deal with noisy and missing data. On top of it, these cascading independent modules assume an interface is predetermined. This interface is typically a bottleneck and limits the flow of information, particularly regarding uncertainty. Finally, there is redundant computation, and we all know latency is safety critical for self-driving cars. One example is that both detection and prediction benefit from reasoning about multiple past observations where motion reasoning is needed. Instead of assuming that the kinematic state provided by, prediction, by perception is correct and that it can capture all details despite being so compact, can we learn a shared representation value for the two tasks? Avoiding separate perception and prediction models will lower the reaction time, produce richer representations thanks to joint optimization, and it will still preserve the interpretability of both. To recap, joint perception and prediction is interpretable and, pre and preserves the ability to incorporate prior knowledge offered by the traditional pipeline. Meanwhile, it avoids handcrafting features, naturally propagates uncertainty across the stack and allows for faster reaction times by avoiding redundant computation. Next, we look into how can we learn rich representations of the scene. The first building block is how to extract information from the past. For instance, a subtle break might indicate that a vehicle has the intention to stop or to turn. The first step forward from a traditional pipeline is how to extract meaningful features from past trajectories, replacing the tracker state as the main source of information. This step is done for each actor. A simple option is to rasterize the geometry of the perceived traffic participants in a multi-channel bird's eye view image local to each actor as shown in the image. Then a subsequent convolutional neural network processing extracts the so-called actor features. Although simple to implement, this representation is memory heavy and assumes perfectly robust detection and tracking. Past trajectory waypoints together with the uncertainty if available can be encoded through a recurrent neural network a temporal one-dimensional convolutional neural network or even a graph neural network where the ordering is passed as a feature. 
The user presentation is very compact, but it can be challenging to properly handle missing data. Also, the uncertainty provided to the encoder is typically too limited in exclusivity. To avoid the previous drawbacks, Fast and Furious proposed a single model to unify perception and prediction. The input is the history of previous LiDAR sweep. Using the pose of the self-driving vehicle at different time steps, we can project past sweeps to the current coordinate frame. We can then voxelize the point cloud into a bird's eye view tensor with four dimensions, height, width, time, and depth. Now we can run 3D convolutions to fuse spatial temporal information. Then a simple fully convolutional decoder outputs classification scores and regression targets and predicts a series of future waypoints. Finally, these are post-processed by using confidence thresholding and non-maximum suppression. And tracking is done heuristically by matching the current detections to previous predictions. In this video, we show the LiDAR point cloud together with the detection scores, bounding boxes, and the short-term motion forecast for one second into the future. The vehicles are color-coded according, according to the tracker. Because of the heuristic tracker as post-processing proposed in Fast and Furious, the full temporal history contained in the tracks is not used by detection and prediction, but rather just the history captured by a handful of previous LiDAR sweeps. To remedy this, PMPNet brings explicit object tracking into the loop so that all tasks can benefit from rich temporal context. PMPNet works as follows. 3D object detection is first performed. Then detections are matched across time and their past trajectories are smoothed by exploiting fully learnable functions. Finally, it extracts long-term trajectory level features for motion forecasting from both past trajectories and the deep features. To keep track of objects and their occlusion, we equip the model with an explicit memory capturing appearance as well as the inferred trajectories. In this snippet, self-driving vehicle is located at the left center. And we show the perception and prediction results of PMPNet on vehicles and pedestrians within 100 meters. Different colors denote different object identities, and we visualize only high confidence detection at each frame for, for clarity. Maps provide important context for both detection and prediction. For instance, it is more likely to find a vehicle on the road than on the sidewalk, and we know it is likely that a vehicle keeps its current lane in the future. In this section, we explore how to learn representations, flexible representations of high definition maps and how we can fuse this with past context that we have extracted from LIDAR. Representing the high definition map as a spatial raster has been the most popular approach. One could use colors or masks to represent semantic elements and use standard 2D CNNs to learn a rich encoding. This approach is simple to implement and is natural for fusing with other dense feature maps as well as outputting dense predictions. However, the dense representation also means that we are constrained by memory to a small region of interest with limited resolution. Now we show how Intenda leverages a rasterized map to predict intention. A two-stream architecture is proposed, which encodes the LiDAR and the map raster with two DCNNs separately. Then it fuses them by simply concatenating along the feature dimension. By adding one more header to the model, Intended also performs multi-class classification over actions such as turning right, stopping, being parked, or lane changing. This allows the planner to not only reason about occupancy, but also semantics. Let's see some qualitative results. The output of the network are split into two visualizations. On the top, we can see the detections and forecasted trajectories. And on the bottom, we show the high-level action prediction, which provides a more interpretable way to see the driver's intention than just future trajectories which is useful for motion planning. More precisely, this gives us the probability of a car being parked, stopped, keeping lane, lane changing or turning. A purple bounding box means our model believes the, the vehicle is parked. In the spectrum between yellow and red, the redder, the higher the probability of stopping. We visualize the likelihood of keeping the lane turning or lane changing with the length of these arrows. Recently, works have explored lane graph lane graph-based representations for maps to avoid the memory-intensive rasterization. The main idea is to represent lane segments as nodes and semantic relationships as edges and leverage graph neural networks or transformers to learn a compact representation that is able to reason about the whole map topology. This approach has the benefit of being parameter efficient and preserving full spatial resolution. Directly working with numerical coordinates also allows effective early fusion with trajectories. 
However, effective fusion with sensor observation is no longer trivial, and it remains an important challenge to be tackled by future work. The models we have presented so far do not do any explicit interaction reasoning, but these interactions are actually everywhere. Let's see why this is important. In this scenario, we can see two cars reaching at the intersection with no evidence of any of them breaking. If we have a model that just looks at the local road topology and then and the past motion of each actor independently, the most likely prediction is just the extrapolation of the previous motion, ending in a collision despite our belief of this event to be highly unlikely. But can we instead explicitly reason about the interaction between them by taking into account the relative location, speed, and the context of the intersection? This will be achieved by exchanging information between actors to make more informed inferences, such as predicting that the car on the left would most likely yield. Now let's see how we can model these interactions in practice. We can think of the interaction reasoning as a second stage within our perception and prediction framework right after we perform detection. Several works propose to use social pooling techniques, that is, under some definition of neighborhood, to take the features from neighboring traffic participants and scatter them into a spatial social tensor, potentially running a small CNN on top to further process these features, and finally performing average or max pooling to the spatial dimensions to obtain the so-called social feature vector. Previous works have defined the neighborhood based on L2 distance like social STM, or taking into account our prior knowledge that vehicles in neighboring lanes matter most as convolutional social pooling, making the lane a distance unit in a tensor. However, as can be seen in the model diagram, these, tens these social tensors are dense, meaning that even if the neighborhood is sparse or empty, they still need to be computed. Thus, lots of resources are misused. An alternative dense attention approach has also been proposed in Carnet. It consists of attending to a spatial feature map that captures static environment and dynamic actors. This feature, this feature map can be obtained through a CNN that processes a LiDAR input, for, LiDAR input stream, for instance. Then CarNet uses a combination of single source attention to focus on the most relevant aspect for the target actor and multi-source attention to take into account scattered features that might also be relevant. Recent works have also leveraged the popular transformer module to incorporate contextual information. In the interaction transformer work, the interaction module recurrently attends to different actors in the scene to capture interaction across time. The MM transformer works takes, in, takes it one step farther by using a unified transformer architecture to cap capture both actor map as well as actor-actor interactions. Next, let's take a look at how we can bring interactions into the challenging joint perception and prediction setting. We start with the fuse, LiDAR, and map features from the whole scene, as we've seen before. Now, to facilitate actor level interaction reasoning, we extend the original single stage model for a second actor feature extraction stage. For each detected actor, we extract features in a region of interest around it, further processing it with a CNN with global pooling to obtain the final feature vector of each actor. At this point, interaction between actors is only implicitly, cap implicitly captured by the backbone features. We add inductive biases by making this reasoning explicit. We construct an interac interaction graph with actors and nodes and use a spatially aware graph neural network to aggregate neighboring features. Finally, we use a simple MLP decoder to decode a Gaussian trajectory from the refined actor features. Let's take a closer look at the interaction model. The spatially aware graph neural network derives its relational reasoning power from four Lernamo operations. We first initialize its node state with per actor features and spatial information. Then the information is passed in a relative coordinate frame to the heading of the receiver node. These messages are aggregated to incorporate the influence of other actors. And lastly, each actor state is updated taking into account the aggregated message and its previous state. We find that the spatially aware message passing is critical in encoding interaction. We compare our method qualitatively against the other methods in a challenging scenario with very fast moving traffic. The ground truth trajectories are shown in gray, while the Gaussian predictions are shown in a color map ranging from blue at the current time step to pink at three seconds. We highlight collisions with a red circle, and we can see that our model is the only one that produces a socially consistent prediction with a low probability of collision. The results look socially consistent as expected from the explicit interaction reason. The main failure mode of this method are intersections or branching points where the unimodal Gaussian output can't handle the multimodality in expected behavior. 
This will be the focus of the next section. So far, we focused on how to learn a rich representation of the scene and how to do this jointly for perception and prediction. Next, we look into how we can parameterize our future predictions as well as models that incorporate the right inductive biases. We start with modeling uncertainty at the actor level. Capturing the uncertainty and multimodality of the trajectory distribution of an actor is key to safety in autonomy, as the motion planner needs to be able to react to any possible future. Even though we only observe a single future in each log, displayed in blue in the example, there is an underlying distribution that entails all the behavior an actor could have done, which we depict in black. As we will see in the loss and metric section later, this poses a big challenge to overcome. The simplest way to capture this multimodal uncertainty is to have a mixture of Gaussian trajectory, basically a predefined number of modes where each mode is a sequence of bivariate Gaussian waypoints over time, as displayed in the image. The trajectory regression can be reparametrized as a classification over anchor trajectories in a subsequent offset regression. The anchors can come from an offline clustering of the trajectories in the training set. However, training directly with negative log likelihood of this distribution tends to be unstable as we only observe one of the modes in the ground truth. We will cover this aspect more in detail in the final block of this talk. A purely classification-based approach is trajectory sets. Basically, a final set of trajectories is defined and the problem becomes a multi-class classification over those trajectories. Typically, these trajectories are generated by enrolling the kinematic state in a bicycle model with realistic control variations. This has the great advantage that we can easily incorporate prior knowledge into the trajectory set, for instance, guaranteeing feasible vehicle dynamics. Examples are shown in the figure where different sets of trajectories are used at different instantaneous velocities. On the other hand, the number of trajectories needed to ensure coverage of all the possibilities is large as it, this representation is not contextual. Instead of attempting to capture the marginal distribution over the whole horizon, in the future trajectories, we can instead model the one-step conditional distribution. Basically, what's the distribution over waypoints at time step t plus one, given a sample trajectory up to time step t? This has the advantage that a simple, unimodal, and well-known distribution such as a Gaussian can be used to model each step. Through sequential sampling, this method can achieve multimodal trajectories in the interval between two times if the interval between two time steps is minor. However, sequential sampling is low and suffers from compounding errors. Let's take a closer look at this problem. During training, the model is conditioned on the ground truth trajectory up to time t, and it is only trained to predict the next waypoint. Note that, of course, this conditioning is perfect as it is uh, the ground truth. At inference, however, it is conditioned on a sample trajectory coming from the model, which might contain errors. This sample trajectory might slowly diverge from the ground truth, becoming unrealistic. At that point, when the next point is queried, it looks like an out of distribution data point to the model and the errors keep compounding. Yet another paradigm is goal-based prediction. The key insight here is that for prediction within a moderate horizon, time horizon, future modes can be effectively captured by a set of target endpoints or paths derived from the map. Typically, the prediction task is broken down into two steps. First, we classify over possible goal points or paths. And then for each mode generated, and for, for each mode, we generate and, and score a set of trajectories. In the case, the goal is represented as a base path. The trajectory can be predicted as offsets from the lane center lines, which eases prediction by adding prior knowledge. The key advantage of this approach arises from its, from its explicit map relative parameterization which serves as a spatial anchor that ties trajectories to map. Empirically, these methods have demonstrated accurate long-term pre long predictions that generalize to diverse road topologies. The main challenge of this approach is capturing the non-compliant actor behaviors that might deviate from the lane graph. Finally, a different but natural way to capture multimodality is through occupancy grid maps. These approaches discretize the local region around the actor into bins, and then predict a categorical distribution over the grid cells at each future time, future time step. Since each cell encodes the probability of the actor being there, it's inherently multimodal. Basically, to predict a multimodal distribution, the model just needs to place probability in different grid cells. This can be appreciated in the results from the discrete residual flow model, which can reason about the environment very accurately, avoiding parked cars and following crosswalks and sidewalks. As opposed to Gaussian mixtures, the classification loss of these methods makes optimization very stable. 
However, this is a fairly memory consuming representation since we predict a dense grid for each actor at each time step. Thank you for your attention. Now I will leave you with Simon, who will present the rest of the tutorial. Thanks, Sergio. Hi, everyone. My name is Simon, and I'm also a research scientist at Wabi. In the previous section, we have seen how to model the uncertainty at the actor level. However, the marginal distribution doesn't tell us how the behavior of our self driving vehicle affect the other. Let's take a look at the recent work that explored this area. Conditional prediction models aim to characterize the conditional distribution over other actors' behavior given their own. In the example we show here, the blue car will be the ego vehicle, and we can see how the marginal and conditional prediction for the red car would differ when the ego vehicle plans a lane change maneuver that invades its lane. But in the context of autonomy, having independent prediction and planning modules that cascade is not enough, since when the self-driving vehicle evaluate multiple candidate behaviors, it will not be taking into account of the impact of its own plans. Instead, one can condition the prediction on each possible plan, then essentially we'll be running prediction n times where n is the number of candidate ego trajectories. A big challenge with the current approach to conditional prediction is causal confusion. Let's say there are two actors on the road. If we perform marginal prediction, we obtain prediction that go through the intersection since it's a green light. However, if we condition on the actor with the blue trajectory, which abruptly stop before the intersection, the conditional prediction for the other actor is also a stop trajectory. In this case, the model is confusing causality with correlation. Since in the data, whenever a vehicle stops at the intersection, they all do. Another challenge with this approach are the computational resources required. As we discussed, these methods run prediction for every conditional, meaning an expensive linear scaling on the number of eagle plans. Moreover, all these new predictions need to be costed by our motion planner, which also adds additional overhead. In this next section, we'll talk about some consistent prediction. So far, we have seen how different models capture uncertainty and multimodality at the actor level, but this does not allow us to understand the distinct future at the scene level. To better illustrate this concept, let's look at an example. In the bottom left cartoon, we see the output of a marginal prediction model which characterized all possible futures of two turning vehicles in front of the SDV. Since our model independently, the SDV cannot understand the distinct possibilities illustrated on the right. The fact that both actors could yield to the SDV to pass or both turning if the SDV yields. This motivates us to better understand the scene as a whole so that SDV can anticipate and plan multiple reactions, allowing it to be safer and more proactive. In order to do this, we need to model both the actors jointly and generate some consistent motion forecasts of actors as shown on the right. So far, joint autoregressive models have been the main approach for tackling this problem. At a high level, this approach is a simple extension of an autoregressive approach that we have introduced in the previous section. Instead of generating the full trajectory in one shot, each trajectory is unrolled from a sequence of one-step conditional distributions across time. The key difference is that now, these one-step distributions are conditioned on not only in an actor's past context, but also the past context of other neighboring actors. In other words, the prediction at time t is conditioned on the sample of all neighboring actors at time t minus one, as illustrated here. This, in fact, is a realistic model of how actors influence each other in the real world, since they only saw each other's actions after it's occurred. This has the advantage that it's easy to make counterfactual predictions where we can ask how the whole scene would change if we know the trajectory of one or more actors. However, this interaction modeling adds additional complexity, which makes the slow sequential sampling and compounding error issues of autoregressive predictions even worse. And as such, it hasn't been shown to work well past, um, past the perfect procession paradigm. Now, I'd like to tell you an alternative way of performing joint prediction in a one-shot fashion um, that is not autoregressive, which can avoid the issue with the autoregressive formulations. The main idea here is to have a scene latent variable responsible for capturing unobserved scene dynamics. In fact, we make this latent variable continuous and assume we can capture all stochasticity in the scene. 
we adopt a distributed representation across actors in an interaction graph such that I can scale to any scenario. Then by sampling from the scene latent space and passing the sample through a graph decoder, we can generate consistent trajectories for all actors in the scene. Let's take a closer look at how this works in practice. We first extract actor features as, previously have, as we have previously described. We then have a graph neural network prior that infer the distribution over the scene latency. Then we can sample from the latent and have a deterministic decoder to produce one realization of the future trajectories. We can then sample again to obtain a distinct future. Although the sampling process is illustrated as sequential over clarity, it occurs in parallel since there's no dependency between the different samples. Here, we showcase the actual predictions from our model at a four-way intersection. In the first possible future showing blue, the traffic at the vertical unprotected left turn at the intersection proceeds and the horizontal traffic is stopped. In the second possible future showing pink, the vehicles in the vertical road are stopped and the ones in the horizontal roads accelerate. In reality, these two futures are controlled by the future traffic light state at the intersection, which are unobserved. But it seems that our latent variable model managed to learn their underlying dynamics including the fact that a traffic light state must switch in the future. In this visualization, we sample two distinct realizations of the scene from our model and interpolate between them in the latent space. Taking a look at the top left example, we see that our model captures high level modality of the vehicle going straight through an intersection versus turning right. As we interpolate between these two possible realizations, the trajectory snaps from one to the other, accurately capturing the fact that something in between is not realistic. On the top right, we see the model captures the intersection interaction between the horizontal traffic and vertical traffic where the actor nudging out only if the horizontal traffic flow yields. Now in this qualitative video, we sample 50 scenes and aggregate them using transparency to show to recover the marginal distribution that's implicitly captured by our model. This also revealed the main drawback of our implicit generated model, which is the fact that it relies on Monte Carlo sampling for getting the coverage. However, having complete coverage of possible futures is often mission critical and safety critical. Relying on Monte Carlo samples can be risky since we concentrate too much on the main modes and can miss rare yet safety critical futures. A line of work that aims to address the shortcoming of the sampling based models learn to output a set of covering trajectories instead of random samples. Earlier work rely on vanilla Euclidean distance of the diverse, as the diversity metric, which could deteriorate the prediction's precision. Instead, latest work on optimizing for downstream planning diversity is a promising approach that has been mitigated with problem. Next, let's look into a different way to look at future prediction, inspired by robotics literature, where we move away from reasoning about individual actors and instead predict the future at the scene level. Let's consider this scenario where the SDV is heading north at the intersection. The instance-based PMP model, like the ones we've seen so far, predict trajectories for a detected bounding box only if its confidence score is higher than a threshold. The, predict the predictions are then passed to the planner to find a safe maneuver. However, if the confidence score is a little below the threshold, an object can be completely ignored by the PMP model and not pass the planner at all. This can potentially lead to some very unsafe situations. To tackle this problem, P3 predicts a semantic segmentation over time, which is totally instance free. In this representation, each pixel captures the probability of that grid cell being occupied at a particular point in time by some semantic class such as vehicles or pedestrians. To do this, a recurrent occupancy model takes as input the few scene features that we've covered earlier and subsequently predicts stepwise occupancy offsets in log likelihood space. This output representation is very close to the safety cost planners typically employ, removing the need for any heuristic post-processing. Even though occupancy will allow the planner to penalize collisions, it will not have enough information to keep a safe headway distance with actors in front as there's no sense of motion. To mitigate this problem, a dense temporal motion field can be predicted as well, 
where two dimensional vectors of the motion flow is predicted at each pixel. However, one could still end up with inconsistent occupancy and motion fields. Instead, one can predict only the current occupancy and warp it probabilistically into the future using the temporal motion field. This way, consistency between the two outputs is guaranteed. Here, we highlight the expressivity of the simple param parameterization. Even though there are no explicit instances, the model can sharply identify odd objects in the scene and predict highly complex multimodal distributions. For instance, in the example, it identifies that a highlighted vehicle might continue straight, turn left, or turn right at the intersection. We also observe multimodality in the pedestrians where it identifies crossing the crosswalk or continuing along the sidewalk as potential modes. Finally, Fiery showed that with a variation on occupancy and motion parameterizations, instant segmentation can also be inferred heuristically. The main idea here is to use the future motion flow to trace back the identity of an object. As you can see in the rightmost image, each object has been color-coded based on their identity. Now, both instance-based and instant-free approaches have their pros and cons. Instance-based methods enjoy explicit reasoning about interactions, they're a compact, memory-efficient representation, they're close to other tasks such as traffic simulation, but on the flip side, post-processing is needed to identify the instances which we have seen could be unsafe. And the computation varies with the number of actors, which can be challenging in crowded regions. In contrast, instance-free approaches bypass any post-processing, enjoy constant runtime and a simple pipeline they can capture any object shape up to resolution errors. However, they can be quite memory intensive, and this prevents us from characterizing some consistent futures by sampling. In this last section, we'll discuss the loss and learning approaches that ties everything we talked about together. We will also touch on the various metrics for evaluating different types of prediction models that we've introduced. The main prediction objective is accurately reconstructing ground truth future trajectories. As such, most prediction models employ a simple symmetric reconstruction loss. In the non-probabilistic setting, this takes the form of distance between the ground truth and predicted waypoints, such as L2 or Huber loss for better robustness for outliers. In the probabilistic setting, we employ negative log likelihood of the ground truth waypoint under the predicted distribution. The issue with these symmetric loss is that they do not reflect well the impact on the downstream task of motion planning. This is because the decision-making process in a self-driving car is normally very structured, particularly relying on the map topology. Let us illustrate this with an example. The green trajectory here represent the ground truth's future behavior for the blue vehicle, and the red and blue trajectories are two predictions that have the same exact L2 loss, yet have very different impact in planning. In the left figure, if we predict the red trajectory, it will cost STV to swerve out of the road to avoid that collision and in contrast, predicting the blue trajectory wouldn't have any major impact on autonomy. A similar story holds in the right image, where if the red trajectory is predicted, the self-driving car will think there's no obstacle in front and will accelerate and get too close to the blue vehicle, causing a future heartbreak and dangerous scenario. Based on these insights, it's natural to add a jewelry loss and incorporate our prior knowledge about what's important in driving. Now in our work, we have chosen to focus on the reachable lanes and the self-driving vehicle routes. More precisely, we can first associate each vehicle to a lane and obtain its reachable lanes, shown as the green shaded area. Then we can reward prediction that stay within such an area and penalize going outside of it like the red trajectories in the top left. There's some exceptions though. Since some actors behave in the non-compliant manner as shown in the top right drawing, and we want our model to still capture this behavior, we will not apply the prior loss when the ground truth doesn't follow the reachable lanes. And finally, we can similarly reward high precision and recall of vehicles driving close to the self-driving vehicle route, making the distinction of being inside versus outside of it. As we have touched on in the previous section, it is critical to have the right upper representation in order to capture the multimodal uncertainty of actors' future trajectories. 
The most prevalent approach, as we've shown, is representing the distribution as a mixture of Gaussians. However, as many works have pointed out, naively using the same log likelihood loss often encounters an optimization issues, which results in more collapse and poor diversity. In other words, the learned model will fail to recover less likely, but also mission critical possibilities. This is because in the data set, we only observe a single future and as illustrated on the bottom left, applying the loss on all predictive modes will discourage the model from generating diverse predictions. As a result, many works have explored alternative to encourage diversity. And the most notable example is the variety loss, which only selects the mode with minimum loss for learning. And another option is to select the predictive mode with the best matching angle as shown on the right to encourage the model to capture diverse path instead of just a speed profile. Now, putting these two ideas together, let's take a look at our work on incorporating prior knowledge in multimodal prediction. Following previous work, we used the same variety laws for likelihood-based training. First, we define the true mode as the one where the mean is closest to the ground truth trajectory, which is shown in green in the diagram below. In this case, the mode being selected is the gray one. Then a cross entropy loss is applied to the mixture coefficient and a Gaussian negative log likelihood only to the waypoints of the true mode. Despite the improved stability, this has the disadvantage that it doesn't give signal to the whole distribution. And in this case, the orange Gaussian waypoints are left untrained. Under this multi-task learning framework, we can easily incorporate our prior knowledge loss as an extra term. The only thing we need to do is sample many trajectories from the distribution, compute their likelihood, and use reinforce to estimate a gradient for learning. A clear advantage shown by the prior loss gradients is that this law supervises all modes through their samples, not just the closest one to the ground truth. Intuitively, this difference makes sense since we can apply our prior knowledge to any sample because it's only dependent on a map and the SDV route. In contrast, we only observe one future realization for likelihood-based training. Let's take a look at the qualitative visualization. The changes of adding our prior loss are very evident. As you can see, compared to the baseline, the distributions become less entropic and follow the map better, while still being able to capture non-compliant and off-road behaviors. Now, let's take a look at the possible failure modes of predicting multimodal futures. In the diagram below, the vehicle is on a road where it can go straight or turn left. Therefore, the underlying ground truth data distribution might contain different speed profiles for these two high-level options, as shown by the black arrow. On the left, an accurate model could closely characterize the distribution over trajectories. In the middle, the model prediction covered the ground truth distribution, but we also see unrealistic samples. We can say this prediction has high recall but low precision. On the contrary, the last model has very low entropy and only cover one of the modes in the ground truth distribution, exhibiting high precision but low recall. It's actually difficult to measure how well a prediction model captures the true distribution since we only observe one realization. Now, work, most works take the approach of separately quantifying the precision and recall characteristic of learned distribution. On the recall side, metrics consider only the best sample set from the model, either measuring the minimum displacement from the ground truth or a binary hit or miss based on if it falls within some distant threshold. On the precision side, Metrics either measure the expected displacement across all samples from the model or leverage the map to evaluate the ratio of samples that respect traffic rules. So far, we've been looking at direct evaluation of the motion forecasts at a module level. However, despite having multiple metrics that attempt to evaluate different aspects of distribution, there is always a disconnect of these metrics with the angle of driving. Recent works have started to bridge this gap by explicitly evaluating the prediction models in the broader context of self-driving system in order to understand how it really influenced the safety and comfort of the self-driving vehicle's trajectory. In some of our latest work, we also evaluate the autonomy system performance in terms of collision rates, lateral acceleration, jerk, and altitude distance relative to human driving in order to have a holistic evaluation of our prediction model. Here, we showcase a qualitative examples on how the failure modes of a prediction system impact SDV motion planning. 
and why module level prediction metrics, especially those evaluating only the coverage aspect, might not tell the whole story. The column corresponds to a different time step of the unrolled future horizon of five seconds. We show both the SDV motion plan and the other actors' trajectories. In blue is the SDV plan. In the black box without filling, the expert demonstration, the prediction samples are shown in yellow, and the ground truth trajectory of other actors are in light gray, unless they're in collision with the SDV plan at any point, in which case we show them in red. Please focus on the vehicle of interest marked with a circle throughout the sequence. We can see how the prediction for the baseline gets more and more fanned out over time. And ultimately, forcing the SDV to swerve into the opposing traffic and collide. In contrast, when using our prior laws, both the predictions as well as the SDV normally follow their lengths. Now let's switch gear a little and talk about a learning objective in the context of joint prediction. The new challenge here is that we can no longer calculate loss over actors separately and then take a simple average. Instead, we need to evaluate them together to capture some consistency. In our work on learning an implicit latent variable model, we tackle this challenge by leveraging the conditional variational encoder framework. At a high level, this is how it works. On top of the detection loss, we first introduce a KL loss that penalizes divergence between the encoder and prior network. This constrains the sampling distribution used in training and inference to be similar. Then we use the encoder decoder network to convert the ground truth trajectories into a sin latent distribution and then sample and decode it back. Then we can apply a simple distance based reconstruction loss on the decoded trajectory. This process of encoding and decoding ensures that the loss is applied at the scene level rather, rather than on the individual actors. Now, to measure the performance of scene consistent motion forecasting, the metric also needs to reason about all actors together. Latest works have proposed three types of metrics. First, we have the scene level displacement metrics, which evaluate displacements from all actors in the scene rather than taking average over actors. To understand this, Consider the cartoon uh, below. We have a left turning scenario where a model that produced prediction one and two will score very well on actor level displacement metrics, especially when we take minimum over all the actors, despite not being socially consistent. On the other hand, the scene level displacement metrics will select prediction three as the most consistent sample for evaluation, and indeed, that is the most scene consistent predictions. And secondly, we can also extend the normal binary hit or miss metrics to the scene consistent prediction setting by similarly requiring hits for all actors in the scene for it to be considered a hit overall. And lastly, by varying a metric, by varying a threshold on model confidence on predicted scene samples, we can further summarize the miss rates in a PR curve similar to detection. Lastly, Let's take a look at prediction loss and metrics in the instance-free setting. Designing loss for instance-free prediction is actually very simple. Occupancy at each pixel is trained with a binary cross entropy loss, and this is averaged across space and time. One important aspect is to be able to balance positive and negative pixels, namely when it's occupied or not, for which hard negative mining is used. And when used a flow-based parameterization, this loss also provides supervision to the motion field. The multimodal motion field where multiple motion vectors are predicted at each pixel can be trained similar to the multimodal trajectory prediction using a variety of laws that supervise the closest mode to the ground truth on the foreground pixels in order to encourage diversity. Since the occupancy is a binary classification per pixel, we can measure its precision recall curve to measure how well the predictions are ranked. In other words, whether a more likely prediction actually is occupied more frequently than a low probability one. This, however, does not measure how well calibrated are the probabilities, which can be important for accurate risk assessment. For that, we will leverage reliability diagrams. When inferring the instance segmentation as well, a video panoptic quality metric can be employed to quantify how well instances are tracked over time. And finally, the motion can be evaluated with simple regression metrics, such as the foreground, foreground L1 error. Now, this brings us to our conclusion. We have seen that learning a rich representation of the scene is the crucial foundation for accurate motion forecasting. 
In this tutorial, we explore how to encode tracks, map context, and actor-to-actor -actor interaction effectively. And also more importantly, we show how they can all be tied together in a joint perception and prediction framework with unique benefits. Furthermore, we highlighted the, the importance of capturing uncertainty and multimodality on autonomy's safety, and went over the key techniques in representing multiple uncertain futures. Now, towards a holistic and interactive understanding of the future, conditional prediction and sync consistent joint prediction is becoming more and more critical for enabling safe and proactive planning via contingencies. And finally, we have seen that instance free PMP is a promising direction that pre presents a simple and effective alternative. And this concludes our tutorial on prediction. Thank you very much. Cool. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. We currently don't have any, so you're also welcome to ask your question live in the Zoom session. Uh, may I ask two questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, the first question is, uh, how to do the geo split so that can construct the uh, uh, topological structure uh, in the uh, in your project? Sorry, maybe I I I didn't fully get it. Do you mind uh, for Simon if if you have a clear understanding? Uh, just like uh, um, just like we have a lot of data. Uh, um, so how do you do the geo split so that you can just like uh, create your node and then the relationship between each node so that how just how do you do the split because you have a lot of data uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, formal uh, perception data set, and then th those data pipeline, and how do you do the geo split so that you construct your uh, topological uh, structure of the data to do the modeling uh, here? Yeah, I think uh, you are so basically you are um, asking about the high definition map con construction, right? Um, I think so in the works that we've presented, we didn't really like basically that was provided as a data set. Um, I'm not entirely sure actually about what methods um, are there to, to build a high definition map at the large scale basically. I see, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, does that answer your question? And you also mentioned you had two questions. Is there a follow up? Uh, hold on a second. Let me. I need to re rethink the 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 question. Hold on a second. Sorry. Uh, I will post on the Slack channel later, and then give the chance to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Let us know if we're not interpreting your question correctly as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Bing and Abbas will know more about the geo split. Yeah, maybe we can let uh, them ask the questions in the channel later. Cool, sounds good. If there's uh, no other questions, uh, since we're a little bit behind schedule, we can go ahead and instead start with the motion planning session. Cool, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Wen Yuanzheng, a research scientist at Wabi. In the following, my colleague Abbas and I will give a tutorial on learning-based end-to-end planning approaches. But before we directly jump into details of these approaches, let's take a look why we need them in the first place. As we can see in the diagram, traditional planning approaches typically assume that perception and prediction has already been solved with high precision using separate modules. However, such a hard barrier between different modules 
may lead to suboptimal performance, since some useful information may be lost when moving from one module to another. Also, this is a heavy system and requires a significant amount of effort to achieve low latency. Therefore, the community is also exploring another possibility, basically build an end-to-end -end trainable model which takes raw sensor data as input and directly output driving command. For example, we can use a huge deep neural network to do this and achieve low latency. But this method sacrifices the interpretability of traditional modular approach and brings new problems of validating the system and guarantee safety. Based on these concerns, we can go one step further. As shown in the diagram, we can build a single model but with modular-like components and carefully design each module such that the whole model is end-to-end -end trainable. It still enjoys the benefits of end-to-end -end training and low latency inference. Moreover, we can easily encode prior knowledge into the model and validate each module similar to what we do for traditional method. In the following, I'll first introduce some representative end-to-end -end driving methods and try to give an overview of different methods as well as their pros and cons. And then Abbas will introduce some efforts towards building an end-to-end -end interpretable neural motion pattern. Here's an overview of the topics that we're gonna touch on, including what input modalities that end-to-end -end driving approaches typically use, how they build the model architectures, what are the output representations, and how they train the model. Lastly, we also have topics on interpretability and reactivity. Let's first look at different input modalities. Image or camera sensor data is the most straightforward input modality as human also relies on such inputs to drive a car. Monocular image is one popular choice. Moreover, stereo images or camera, multi-camera setups have been shown to bring further gains especially at junctions. Images with more semantic information has been attracting more interest in recent years. For example, some segmentation or flow. To do this, one can use a pre-trained network to extract segmentation results from an RGB image, and then fit these results into a subsequent driving network. Although camera sensors are cheap, image suffer a lot from poor lighting conditions and lack accurate 3D information. Therefore, industry, as well as more and more academic lab, are exploring another modality, LiDAR point clouds. LiDAR is sparse and irregular, and thus it is not naturally suited for seeing architectures. In the end-to-end -end interpretable neural motion planner, they project the LiDAR into a bird's eye view 2D image-like representation, and then process it by a network. There are also other possibilities, such as using PointNet or SparseCom. In contrast to the camera image, LiDAR provides more robust and accurate 3D measurements. And it's also more expensive and lose some semantic information, such as the turning light of a car. Therefore, these two modalities are sometimes used together. Recently, another way to exploit LiDAR information is being proposed. Due to the physical mechanism of a LiDAR, we can get for free the information about free spaces without any objects, surfaces of objects, as well as occluded areas. This creates a visibility map and has shown to be helpful for safe planning. This representation provides auxiliary information about free spaces and thus can be utilized by a planning model to make a safe planning without collision. Since it's just another representation of LiDAR, it also shares some similar pros and cons with bird's eye view representation of LiDAR. Another line of work doesn't use raw sensor data like image or LiDAR. Instead, they assume perception or even prediction is already solved, and thus ground truth bounding boxes of actors are provided. One straightforward way of using such inputs is to rasterize the bounding box into a 2D image and use different channels to encode the information at different time steps. 
Here's another way of using perception inputs. We first define a set of affordances or costs, and then evaluate this cost based on the states of ego car and other actors and feed them into a model. For instance, in jointly learnable behavior and trajectory planning for self-driving vehicles, the others uses a set of costs one of which is the ego car's distance to other vehicles, as shown in the figure. Such an input modality allows for more lightweight model, and it doesn't require handling high dimensional complex raw sensor data. However, it also hides some challenges which only occur when using raw sensor. For example, how shall we plan if the model sometimes fail to detect surrounding objects? As we've discussed in the perception tutorial section, HD map contain rich information of the road and thus an important input modality. Similarly, existing works use maps mostly in two ways, rasterization or affordance. As shown here, we can rasterize different semantic information such as road masks or speed limits into different channels. The main drawback of this representation is the difficulty of encoding prior knowledge. For example, even if we can encode the speed limit into a channel, it's not clear how we can enforce the model to understand that and follow this constraint. We can also explicitly use map information by evaluating the distance from the eagle car trajectory to a targeted center line or to a stop sign, etc and fit them into the model. In this format, it's much easier to encode any prior knowledge. But on the other hand, this requires us to design handcrafted features, such as distance to a center line, which might limit performance. The last piece we're going to talk, show here is the high-level intentions of planning. Since we need to drive our car to a destination instead of driving a random walk, to encode this information, many works rasterize the rod and feed it to the model. This rod can be generated with a rod planner outside of the planning model. Another line of work directly inputs a high level command into the network, such as lane change, keeps lane, stop, etc. One popular way of doing this is to predefine a set of possible commands and train a neural network header for each of them. Then during inference, one can easily choose the corresponding header based on the high level command. Next, we discuss model architectures for end-to-end -end planning. In this area, there's not yet a standard model architecture similar to ResNet in vision tasks. However, most work share similar ideas about how to design a model. The core part is, of course, CNNs, RNs, or MLPs. CNNs are used when the input is images or rasterizations, and RNs are used to encode or decode temporal sequences. MLPs can be used to process discrete or low dimensional data, such as high level commands. Moreover, all three of these architectures can be used together when the model has multiple input modalities. Now, let's take a look at different output representations. The most straightforward way is called actuation. For example, the model can directly output steering or acceleration values. An alternative approach, which attracts more interest these days, is to first output a set of waypoints representing the future positions of the Eagle car. Then we use a PID controller to smooth the waypoints and generate a dynamically feasible trajectory. The waypoints representation can be easily visualized and help us gaining insights to improve the model. Both of these representations are pretty simple and well studied in imitation learning literature. However, it's hard for us to encode prior knowledge to the model, such as driving along a lane and without collision. Inspired by the traditional planning approach, cost-based methods compute costs from models and then use this cost to plan a trajectory.
The core idea is to sample a large variety of trajectory sample first, use a model to assign a cost to each of them, and then pick the minimum cost of trajectory as the final planning. We'll explain this in more details later in the interpretability section. Here, we just show one example from the end-to-end -end interpretable neural motion planner. As shown here, the learned cost map, which is the colorful region in the center, can nicely guide the eagle car to follow the lane, as well as nudge around a parked car. In contrast to actuation-based method, cost-based methods are more interpretable. But one challenge here is that sometimes the training might be higher since we don't have direct supervision for the cost value. Except from these two main paradigms of actuation and cost, there are also other possibilities. For example, a model can output values for a set of predefined affordances, such as distance to a center line or to a vehicle. Or a model can also output results for some auxiliary tasks in addition to the planning output, such as object detection or segmentation. This is believed to help model better understand important semantic information in the scene. Having discussed various planning models, let's now take a look at how we can train these models. A dominant paradigm for training these models is imitation learning. To do this, we need to first collect a data set consisting of pairs of scenarios and expert demonstrations. After conducting a forward pass, the error between the model output and the expert demonstration can be evaluated, and the training objectives will be to minimize this error. The main difficulty here is the distribution shift between training and inference. To address this, data augmentation is widely used. For example, one can add in perturbation to the expert trajectory during training as shown in the red dot. The corresponding input image will look like this. The left one is the original image, and the right one is after perturbation. This will help get more diverse training samples. Alternatively, we can try to collect and label more diverse data. After training a model with the current data set, we can deploy the model on a car and let it actually drive the car. Whenever a dangerous behavior happens, an expert will manually correct the plant trajectory. This data can then be added to the data set, which will in turn be used to train a better model. Imitation learning is a pretty straightforward pipeline. And compared to reinforcement learning, which we'll introduce shortly, this learning scheme has higher sample efficiency. However, even with the help of data augmentation, the distribution shift is still a challenging problem. A more ideal way to address this issue is to do reinforcement learning. Instead of deploying the model in real world, here we can let the model run in a simulator and then collect a reward based on collision rates or goal reaching rates. The training objective is to maximize the expected future rewards. One of the key requirements for this to be successful is a high fidelity simulator, such, as, such that the model trained in a simulator can be transferred to real world. However, building a realistic simulator is itself an open academic question. I think we'll cover more on this subject in our afternoon tutorial section, and you can find many interesting things there. Don't miss it. In addition to the previous two mainstream of learning paradigm, there is a growing interest of a third way in recent years, namely policy distribution. As we mentioned earlier, the imitation learning uses offline logs of expert demonstration, which will inevitably bring distribution shifts between training and inference. On the other hand, reinforcement learning has low sample efficiencies, and thus, it will be hard and time-consuming to directly interact with raw sensor data. 
because the model has to also learn how to perceive the world in addition to how to make a plan. Policy distribution provides a middle ground and aim to address these two issues. The key idea is the following. We first learn an expert model which takes ground truth information as inputs and output a driving command as we show on the left branch in the figure. Those ground truth information can include the now limited to other actors' trajectories, HD map information, and traffic sign, etc. They are encoded with low dimensional compact representation, such as one half vectors. This way, the expert model can only focus solving on how to drive without any difficulty of understanding raw sensor data. Such an expert model can either be learned in a simulator with reinforcement learning or built from man-made rules without learning. Next, a policy network is built by taking raw sensor data as inputs and mapping it to drive driving commands. To train such a policy network, people distill knowledge from the expert model, basically trying to minimize the gaps between outputs from these two models. Such a supervised learning pattern can address the low data efficiency issues that reinforcement learning used to have. Next, Abbas will talk about another two topics, basically the interpretability and the reactivity. Hi, my name is Abbas and I'm a researcher at Wabi. I'll present the rest of this tutorial section. We have now come to one of the most important and difficult challenges in end-to-end -to -end motion planning, the interpretability of the driving model. Since self-driving is a safety critical application, we want the system to work in a way that we can understand. This way, we can obtain an interpretable traceback whenever an error occurs. Or even better, perhaps we can also guarantee that the system is error-free to some extent. In our lab, we try to push the boundary in this direction. Our first work is the end-to-end -end neural motion planner published at CVPR 2019. It uses a deep net to produce a learned cost volume and improve the power of the deep network with detection and prediction tasks. Later, we propose DSDNet, Deep Structured Self-Driving Network which further improves performance and interpretability by outputting a non-parametric multimodal prediction and planning condition on the prediction. The third work investigates how to bypass detection post-processing, which may lose useful information. We propose perceive, predict, and plan safe motion planning through interpretable semantic representations, where we replace instance predictions with, with an instance-free semantic occupancy representation and use learned interpretable planning costs over that to produce planning. Finally, we will present MP3 that proposes a unified model to map, perceive, predict, and plan, removing the reliance of the autonomy software on HD maps. Now let me briefly explain the main idea behind each of them. Here's the model of the end-to-end -end interpretable neural motion planner. Specifically, we feed LiDAR data and HD map into a backbone CNN and extract a backbone feature map. From there, our output decodes detection bounding boxes of actors in the scene, as well as their predicted future motion, as shown in the top right. To conduct planning, the core idea is to generate cost volume using the convolutional networks. Each channel in this volume represents a future time step. And each pixel in the volume represent the cost of traveling to that location at that time step. Then we use a physically valid trajectory sampler to sample a wide variety of trajectories given the current ego pose. The tra these trajectories are guaranteed to follow vehicle dynamic constraints. The cost of each sample trajectory can be obtained by indexing the cost volume at the waypoints along, the, along that trajectory. The minimum cost trajectory will be our final planning output. Importantly, all computations from raw data to final trajectory can be done in a few milliseconds. 
Our model achieves much better quantitative results over strong baselines. But here, let me show you a few qualitative results which I think are more interesting. In all the figures, blue boxes depict detections, red boxes depict the ego car, and the, co the colorful region is the low cost region predicted by our model describing where the ego should drive. On the top left, we show an example of lane following. On the right, on the right we show an example where the ego encounters an intersection. Here, our model shows nice multimodality. The bottom two figures show that our model can navigate along the lanes while avoiding collisions with other cars. Here is a short demo. Our model takes LiDAR and HD map as input and outputs detections, predictions, as well as motion planning cost volume. We highlight low cost regions for different time steps using different colors. Our planned trajectory is shown in red and ground truth trajectory is shown in blue. As we can see here, it follows the lane perfectly. Note that our cost volume captures multimodality. In this case, we can either go straight or change lanes. When approaching intersections, we can either go, uh, go uh, straight or turn right. We can also handle blockage. The cost volume shows a preference to lane change in order to avoid collision. Here are two examples of super nudging in heavy traffic. However, there are still drawbacks. First, planning is not conditioned on the prediction results, which may result in inconsistent and dangerous planning. Second, the model only predicts a single mode future, but the future is actually uncertain. To address these drawbacks, we propose DSDNet, a deep structured self-driving network that jointly reasons about perception, forecasting, and motion planning. Specifically, our method has several advantages. Firstly, computation is shared between modules and thus allows for real-time inference. Secondly, our method explicitly models socially consistent multimodal uncertainties in the future. And finally, our learning-based planner leverages the power of deep learning and takes traffic rules into consideration as well in order to guarantee safety. Now let's have a look at how the model works. Given LiDAR point, point clouds and an HD map as input, we have a neural network to produce backbone features, which will be shared for all our models. We first use these features to, per to perform detection. Our next step is to predict the future behaviors of all actors, as well as their uncertainties, which are shown as colorful regions in the figure. Here, different colors mean different future time steps. This is not a trivial task as we expect to predict a multimodal non-parametric non distribution, which can capture complex situations. More importantly, the behaviors of all actors should be socially consistent. For example, they, they won't collide with each other. To construct such non-parametric distribution, we first sample a dense and diverse set of trajectories for each actor. Then use a neural network to assign an energy to each trajectory based on the input feature data. After normalization, this becomes a distribution. Although we can do this for all actors, we can see here the resulting predictions are not consistent. For example, two distributions may overlap, meaning the two cars will collide with each other, which is not realistic. To tackle this, we propose to conduct message passing between all actors and encode their socially consistent interactions within pairwise energies. This gives us multimodal socially consistent predictions. Finally, our model plans a safe trajectory with a cost minimization procedure, which ensure the produced planning will, be, will have minimal expected collision rate and suits the current scenario. Here, we show some interesting qualitative examples. We visualize the uncertainty through a dense color map. Different color 
colors represent different time steps. This is the uncertainty at one second into the future. This is two seconds into the future. And here is three seconds into the future. As you can see, our algorithm really captures all, all the uncertain uh, features for the car in the circle. Here are more examples. The top left shows that our model is certain about vehicle that follows a straight line. Simultaneously, it is also uncertain about a faraway vehicle that is turning. The remaining three figures show some interesting driving behaviors such as perfectly following a curved lane, turning left and nudging around the park vehicle. Here's a short demo of our model. As you can see, our model nicely captures multimodality, especially for vehicles that are approaching an intersection. When a vehicle is driving on a straight line, our model is certain about its direction and but uncertain about its future velocity. Here is an example where we perfectly predict that the vehicle is stopping and we plan a nudging uh, trajectory to avoid the collision with the parked vehicle. And this shows our model can follow the lane perfectly. So far, we've discussed two efforts on how to improve interpretability. Both of these works detect surrounding actors first and then conduct planning based on the detection results. For example, in this case, the eco car will know an oncoming vehicle is crossing its, its uh, left turn lane and thus yields to that car. However, detection requires post-processing and only reflects an actor if its detection score exceeds a certain threshold. What if the detection score flickers a bit and, uh, and then the eco car mis misdetects that vehicle? In some cases, this will cause a severe collision. To address this, we, prop we propose perceive, predict, and plan, safe motion planning through interpretable semantic representations. Rather than performing object detection and predicting trajectories for each object, this model directly generates semantic future occupancies. Furthermore, the occupancy forecasts are scene-based and instance-free, and hence does not require thresholding of detection scores or performing NMS post-processing. The planner uses these non-parametric spatial temporal occupancy maps along with other interpretable costs to plan a trajectory that is safe, comfortable, and respects traffic routes. Note that the entire model can be trained end-to-end -end since all components are differentiable. Let's dive a bit deeper into the semantic occupancy representation. We consider vehicles, pedestrians, and bikes as the classes for which we want to predict its occupancy. To make the representation more interpretable, we further subdivide these classes semantically as shown in, the, in this hierarchy. For example, for any pixel in the region of interest, we predict how likely it is to be occupied by a vehicle on conflicting lanes, a park vehicle, or any other semantics and classes. In terms of inference process, we take LiDAR sweeps and an HD map as input and extract backbone features with a two stream CNN network. Then a recurrent occupancy update network predicts semantics, semantic occupancies into the future. As you can see, there is no post-processing at the actor level. This is beneficial since the computational cost doesn't increase in more cluttered scenes. Finally, we conduct a planning step. The planner samples a set of trajectories. The cost function is used to score each trajectory considering different aspects of driving. The best trajectory is selected for execution. Here, we show, we show some examples of our interpretable cost functions. For example, the spatial temporal occupancy maps are used to penalize trajectories that overlap potentially occupied regions. We use the map data to penalize trajectories that are not close to the lane centers or violate boundaries or does not follow the given route. We also take into account the smoothness and comfort of the trajectories in the cost functions and penalize, for example, trajectories that are turning at high speed. So as you have seen, the trajectory cost function in our planner considers various aspects of driving. The relative importance of these sub costs are learned jointly with the rest of the pipeline. 
In this video, we visualize our interpretable semantic occupancy as well as our planned trajectory. We unroll our planning into the future as shown with the black solid box and ground truth is shown in an empty box. We use different colors to indicate different semantics that are predicted by our model. As you can see, our semantic occupancy really captures where the other actors are. And as time goes by, the occupancy map changes to provide information of, of where the other actors will go in the next few seconds. And then our planning can use the interpretable costs to produce a safe and compliant trajectory. The methods presented up to now use a high definition map which eases autonomy by providing right geometry and semantic priors. However, this can be unsafe due to the reliance on centimeter level accurate, accurate localization. In the example shown, an inaccuracy makes the SDV follow the wrong path in red, driving into the moving traffic. Moreover, map annotation is very expensive and hard to scale. In contrast, mapless driving has much more relaxed requirements and can be done just from sensor data and a high-level command. This leads to an approach that is fully scalable to new regions. In our proposed mapless driving approach, MP3, we redesigned the autonomy stack to tackle additional challenges, such as the lack of prior information about the lanes. Let's go over our proposed model. We employ a history of LiDAR sweeps as the sensory input to our model, voxelized in bird's eye view. A convolutional backend network extracts semantic and geometric features from the scene, which serve as context to predict interpretable and probabilistic representations of the static and dynamic parts of the environment. In other words, an online map that tells us where it's possible to drive and a dynamic occupancy that estimates how the obstacles might move into the future. These seen semantic representations are past the motion planner to output a trajectory by first reasoning about the route, then sampling candidate trajectories and finally scoring them with respect to various aspects of driving uh, to pick the best one for execution. We now dive deeper into the different components and representations in our model. We leverage convolutional neural networks to predict an online map composed of the road where the vehicle are, uh, vehicles are allowed to drive, the intersections controlled by traffic lights or signs, and the lanes that we can drive legally on. For dynamic obstacles, we propose a novel occupancy, occupancy flow to consistently predict which space will be occupied by other actors as well as their motion field. Given our predicted online map and a high level command coming from any navigation platform such as Google Maps, the desired route is modeled as a dense spatial map predicted by a switch of CNNs. For example, when the command is turn right in 50 meters, the output should be the green, uh, green region in the image. For sampling candidate trajectories, we cannot rely on prior information about the lane centers uh, as, uh, as done in previous mapless approaches, uh, map-based approaches. In, in order to avoid unrealistic trajectories, we use retrieval and clustering where sets of expert trajectories are grouped based on the initial state of the SDV. The examples show the, the cluster for four different initial conditions. The planner then interpretably scores each of the sample trajectories, taking into account various aspects, including keeping away from areas with predicted occupancy to avoid collision, promoting a safe headway based on the relative velocity, penalizing trajectories that move out of drivable area or go, go out of reachable lanes. Moreover, um, we would like to move along the desired route and have a comfortable motion. Here are some examples of our closed loop simulations where we initialize the SDV in interesting states from the log. As it executes the plan actions, 
we can see how the plan shown in blue diverges from the trajectory that the expert performed when the log was recorded shown in black. Here we show an interesting scenario where the STV exhibits cautious behavior around fast moving traffic, similar to what the expert did. In this example, other, in this other example, we first highlight accurate route prediction for a left turn in an atypical map topology. As the other cars pass by, our model shows more conscious at the core of safety in a self-driving vehicle is the behavior around heavily occluded pedestrians. Here we can see our model safely predicts a pedestrian in between cars might jaywalk and we reduce speed accordingly. MP3 can also navigate a heavy, heavily crowded five-way intersection with an atypical topology by driving cautiously. Finally, we can see how it yields to pedestrians at the crosswalk. The last topic for today is about reactivity. As our ego is a participant in traffic, its, it, its actions can affect how other actors behave in future, and that results in a complicated reaction loops, in turn affecting the ego vehicle decision making. This challenging topic is, topic is attracting more interest these days. To see why it's challenging, let's take a look at, the t at this t, t intersection as an example. Planning simply based on a predicted marginal distribution is not good enough, since that will mix different possibilities of the future. For example, on the one end of the spectrum, the rightmost vehicle will yield to the ego car and then make the left turn after the ego passes. In this case, that vehicle reacted to our ego intended plan, and thus the STV can continue to pass the intersection without hesitation. Therefore, the first difficulty is that a planner should be able to consider the reaction, um, um, the reactive behavior of other actors, otherwise it will be over conservative. On the other end of the spectrum, there could be some cases where the rightmost car dangerously turns left without paying attention to our ego car. Such a situation is less likely, but not impossible. This brings the second challenge, which is to ensure safe planning when low probability events can happen. Let's take a look uh, at these two challenges one by one. To consider the reactiveness of each actor, a naive solution is to simply sample a set of potential ego trajectories and for each trajectory make conditional prediction and evaluate the scene. Although sounds reasonable, this solution is too time consuming. Therefore, most efforts in this domain aims to provide an algorithm with efficient inference while maintaining satisfactory results. One popular choice is to build an implicit distribution over all actors' actions, including eco vehicles, to encourage consistency among them. For example, in precog, prediction conditioned on goals in visual multi agent settings. The authors build an RNN style neural network over all actors and use variational inference to evaluate the likelihood of future actions. Another work, PIPE, Planning Informed Trajectory Prediction for Autonomous Driving encodes reactiveness in a CNN. Specifically, it makes predictions conditioned on planning through a tensor fusion module. Although these, work, although these works can enjoy efficient inference, the black box nature of neural networks make it hard to ensure our actors' behavior are in compliance with the traffic rules. To address this, Another paradigm has been proposed recently, namely to build an explicit probability via deep structured model or deep MRF. Here, each actor is a node in the graph and its action can take a random value. Again, this line of work can enjoy mature efficient inference algorithms from graphical model community, such as belief propagation. In addition, the interactions between ego vehicle and other actors are encoded through pairwise energies, which can be designed to maintain certain structures. For example, a collision-based energy can be used to ensure actors will not, will not be colliding to each other in, in any case. 
The downside, though, is that sometimes the structures might be too strong and not amenable to complicated scenarios. How to design learnable pairwise energy would be an interesting future research direction. Now let's take a look at how we can deal with some very unlikely events. Previous planners have tried to find a single optimal trajectory. Since the future is dominated by some high probability event, the planner would be encouraged to, for example, to plan, a, to, plan to continue in a straight trajectory in this T intersection. However, this is not safe when unlikely events can happen. However, a braking maneuver, although safe with respect to the very unlikely event, would be completely unnecessary most of the times in this example, and would actually be uncomfortable and socially confusing for other, for other drivers. Our uh, planner proposed in Lookout, Diverse Multi-Future Prediction and Planning for Self-Driving, follows a pre model predictive style, where we choose a single action to execute now. Along with this decision, we also find feasible long-term trajectories to react to all predicted futures. To achieve this, we first sample a set of short-term actions. Then for each action, we sample a set of possible long-term future trajectories that can correspond to various behaviors. To find the best action, we perform the following optimization. The immediate action should be safe with respect to the worst case worst case prediction. Moreover, the cost to go should not be overly conservative as long as there is a good response to each future. The cost function C contains terms related to safety, progress, and comfort. For each action, we find the optimal response to each scenario from the corresponding long horizon trajectories. First, for the blue scenario, then for the red future scenario. The cost of an action is then computed by the expected cost of contingent plans and the cost of the actions itself, of the action itself. As an example, the cruising action on the left is costly since the safest response to one of the future scenarios include a heartbreak and hence high cost. In contrast, a light, breaking, um, a light breaking action shown on the right enables safe and comfortable contingent plans for the future. Now we showcase our model in closed loop simulation. The STV is at the center, plotting green, the other vehicles in blue and pedestrians in pink. Let's focus on the diverse predictions and the response from contingency planner. The short-term action plan by the STV is plotted in black and the contingent trajectories are plotted in different colors, which in this case account for variations in the speed profile for the left turning car. As we can see, the STV passes the intersection safely and cruises smoothly. In this scenario, the STV plans different accelerating trajectories to, to be safe to the unlikely samples from oncoming traffic coming into our lane and successfully goes across the intersection. Here, our model avoids to heartbreak before making the left turn by planning safe contingent trajectories to the diverse speed profiles from oncoming traffic and it smoothly effectuates an, an uh, unprotected left turn in this fast moving traffic scenario. Okay, let me give you a quick summary of what we have talked about today. We discussed learning-based, end-to-end planning. We've covered different input modalities, output representations, and learning paradigms, and talked about the pros and cons of each. We discussed one of the most important challenges in this area, which is interpretability, and presented four of our uh, efforts that try to push the boundary. Lastly, we talked about the reactivity as well as handling unlikely scenarios safely. This concludes our motion planning tutorial section. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Great, thanks. So 
we'll have a couple more minutes for questions. Feel free to ask your questions live on Zoom or type them into the chat. Thanks. Mm. Uh, okay, I, there is one question, uh, Abbas, when you're on, I'm not sure if you may know the answer to this one. It might not be as related to planning, but it was mentioned before that optical flow would be used to cancel out ego motion for informed tracking. In practice, is monocular camera-based optical flow reliable? If so, what techniques do you prefer? Yeah, I think this might be more a perception or prediction question, right? Uh, so maybe Sergio is or Ben, um, if they have any any comments here. Yeah, if if not right now, uh, I'm sure we can get to the question later on and respond in the chat. Uh, for now, we can go ahead and get started with. Uh, the V2V session, if there's no other questions. We'll try to get to the, that one in the chat later on. Okay, cool, thanks. Hi, my name is Siva and I'm a researcher at Wabi. In this session, we will be discussing V2V, vehicle to vehicle communication. A core component of self-driving is perceiving the world and identifying the actors in the scene, such as vehicles, pedestrians, or cyclists, and forecasting their future motion. We call these tasks perception and prediction. Prior works discussed in the previous sections of this tutorial unify these tasks into a single joint approach, which we call PNP. This joint approach shares computation between tasks for improved efficiency and performance. And significant improvements have been made during the past few years with deep learning and 3D point cloud processing to have better PNP, but issues still remain. For example, PMP suffers from low visibility in faraway areas and occluded regions via limited sensor data as compared to nearby and unoccluded vehicles. Model improvements and training techniques can only go so far to improve PMP when there's little or no evidence. We pursue another direction to improving PMP. Vehicle to vehicle communication, or V2V, allows a fleet of vehicles to cooperatively view the world from multiple viewpoints and communicate what they see with each other thereby seeing through occlusions and seeing further. So we can see that V2V may have potential in improving perception and prediction. And as we get closer to deploying self-driving vehicles at scale in the real world, it's important to think about how they can cooperate to better perform their tasks. With communication, our vehicles can leverage multiple viewpoints to better perceive the world, as well as distribute computation across multiple vehicles to enjoy better computational efficiency. These are important considerations for making roads safer for our civilians. But to properly use V2V, we need to determine the best way to communicate and utilize all this extra information. There are three main questions to consider in this task. What kind of information should we transmit? What's the best way to combine this information? And how can we minimize transmission bandwidth to communicate efficiently? Our work aims to answer these three questions. First, what kind of information should we transmit? Two options that immediately come to mind are to share the input sensory information 
or to share the perception and prediction outputs. Aside from that, there may be other representations of the scene as well that we can transmit. Let's first consider transmitting the sensor data, which we call LiDAR fusion. When we transmit sensor data, we gain the benefits of no information loss. Each SDV has access to the same information seen by others. And for certain sensor data, such as LiDAR, it's easy to combine this information in 3D. We just aggregate the point clouds. However, there are several disadvantages. Sensor data is large in size, as point clouds can be up to 100,000 points. And the more sensors there are on the vehicle, the more information there is to be sent, making it potentially not scalable. In addition, aggregating the lighter point clouds into the shared 3D space loses important information about which STV viewed that observation. To perform lighter aggregation, we simply overlay the lighter sweeps that can be seen on the right. We then perform PNP on the final point cloud. And as mentioned before, this approach of overlaying has the additional con that viewpoint information is lost, as we did not know which point the sensor came from. We now review in more detail previous works that perform LiDAR fusion. For example, Cooper aggregates the raw LiDAR in 3D space in the same corner frame and then processes the joint point cloud. And this other work instead first voxelizes the LiDAR point cloud and then transmits and aligns the voxels, resulting in less bandwidth since the voxelized LiDAR is usually a more compact representation. Now our second option is to transmit the outputs of perception and prediction. The main advantage of this option is that messages will be very compact, as describing bounding boxes and trajectories require very few parameters compared to the LiDAR inputs. However, only transmitting outputs completely discards any scene context. And additionally, output parameterizations have limited expressiveness with just rectangular bounding boxes and a fixed number of waypoints. Then finally, taking the outputs from all the vehicles is prone to having false positives. So how does output fusion work? One simply overlays the bounding boxes and trajectories into the shared coordinate space from each vehicle, as shown on the right in the bird's eye view. Then one can filter out the overlapping instances using non-maximum suppression or perform a more enhanced fusion through tracking filter-based estimation. And so here are some works that do just that. This previous work first proposes to use NMS to remove multiple detections of the same instance, but suffers still from self-positives, false positives. To address this issue, they propose a hybrid approach that leverages either lighter fusion or alpha fusion, depending on the visibility of the actors. So now going from input to output, there still exists intermediate representations in the neural network that can also be used when sharing information. In fact, we can get the best of both worlds by using these intermediate representations as they are compact representations which still contain scene context. Furthermore, their expressiveness is not limited as in the case of output representations and information regarding viewpoint is not discarded as in the case of lighter input fusion. Finally, using these intermediate features leverages distributed computation for multiple vehicles. But a question remains of how we can still aggregate these intermediate representations. One recent approach proposes to transmit the intermediate bird's eye view feature maps and then transforms them into the eagle coordinate frame and then perform element-wise addition of the feature maps to generate the final intermediate representation. Another work, F. Krupper, instead proposes to use the max out operator to aggregate these intermediate feature voxels. This is a bit better than just summing since it emphasizes important features and removes trivial ones. In our approach, V to VNet, we propose to use the transmitting of intermediate features and warping them into the ego vehicle like previous works. But instead with our aggregation, we fuse with the GNN to intelligently aggregate these feature maps and also encode time in a time delay compensation module to modify the feature maps since vehicle via vehicle communication can often have observation time delay. We now give some more details and an overview of V2VNet, the proposed approach. First, sensory information is encoded into a compact intermediate representation, which is then compressed. And then broadcast this to the other vehicles. The messages from the other vehicles are received and then decompressed and all the features are aggregated with the spatially aware graph neural network. Finally, the aggregated features are processed to generate the final perception and prediction outputs. The key component of our method is a spatially aware graph neural network, which intelligently combines observations from multiple viewpoints seen at different points in time. 
We'll now discuss this component in more detail. First, each vehicle receives intermediate features in the bird's eye view, along with the timestamp of the message and the relative pose of the nearby senders. Including the timestamp and relative pose is important, as the V2V involves asynchronous vehicle communication, and the relative pose provides insight into which areas are viewed by each STV. Next, we can candidate the time delay information to the message features and use a CNN to learn to compensate for messages with a delayed timestamp. The time delay is easily accessible as all vehicles have access to a global clock. After day time delay compensation, the messages are aggregated by the GNN. At each message passing stage, the feature maps are warped into the same coordinate frame of the receiving node and features inside the region of interest are used for accumulation. The GNN intelligently aggregates intermediate representations in a spatially aware manner. So we've now discussed how the, we can do, the different ways we can incorporate information from the other vehicles with input fusion, output fusion, and uh, intermediate features. But we still need to make sure this information that we sent with the existing hardware can be sent quickly and efficiently. We want the message to be, be small, but still capture the relevant information. For each fusion method, we now consider what will be the best compression that can be done for effective V2V. For LiDAR fusion, since LiDAR point clouds are quite large, we can use a state-of-the-art point cloud compression system from Google called Draco. And for output fusion, the bounding boxes and trajectories are already very compact, so no compression is needed. And for the neural network intermediate spatial features, we can leverage existing literature for learnable image-based compression, such as Bally's image compression. Now, when it comes to evaluating V2V methods, there's a lack of suitable real-world data sets. Existing data sets are often created in a platoon or convoy setting, where cars closely follow one another, as can be seen on the center image. Observations captured in this setting are highly correlated and therefore fail to capture the diverse V2V scenarios that will occur in practice. For example, in the convoy setting, we'll never see STVs approaching from the opposite direction. Using simulation is another option for generating a V2V dataset. Existing synthetic datasets either use a traffic simulator, such as Sumo, which means no sensor data is available, or use a game engine, such as Grand Theft Auto or Carla, to simulate multi-view point clouds. This latter approach may not have a diversity of scenarios to evaluate V2V in, and the simulated sensor data may have a large domain gap compared to the real world. To come up with a more diverse and realistic V2V dataset, we created a large-scale synthetic V2V dataset using our new high-fidelity LiDAR simulator, which closely matches the real-world scan LiDAR scans. In this dataset, we take the three reconstructions of logs of real-world LiDAR sweeps and simulate them from the viewpoints of the other vehicles in the scene. Then, all the other vehicles can act as STVs. By doing so, our STV topologies directly correspond to real-world traffic scenarios. Here you can see an example of a V2V sim scenario. With this constructed virtual world, we can now simulate realistic LiDAR from different vehicle viewpoints, as shown on the right. Each colored autonomous vehicle has a corresponding colored LiDAR point cloud generated. And we allow about seven SDVs in each frame to be controlled in V2V. So here are some quantitative results now. The average precision measures the detection performance and L2 error measures the error of the predicted trajectories. And the TCR or trajectory collision rate measures the collision rate of the predicted trajectories. With V2Vnet, we reduce the perception error rate by 68% when compared to the single vehicle, no fusion performance shown in the first row. Furthermore, V2Vnet achieves superior performance compared to previous LiDAR fusion baselines and output bounding box and trajectory fusion baselines. As mentioned earlier, transmitting intermediate representations allows for highly compressible mesh sizes. By incorporating the Bally compression, V2Vnet achieves the best trade-off between message size and performance on both PNP metrics. At 10 Hertz, our method only requires about 0.2 megabytes per second during communication, which is easily satisfied as a short, cheapest dedicated short-range communication hardware that provides only about three megabytes per second instead. So V2V performance in PNP tasks also increases with the number of vehicles in the network. As the density of the STVs increase in the real world, V2V communication will become even more effective. V2V also provides dramatic improvements on far away and occluded vehicles, as shown in the top row of the figure, since there is a significant lack of lighter evidence in these cases. Furthermore, V2V net is particularly effective at detecting vehicles with high speed, as shown in the bottom row, beating LiDAR and output fusion by a large margin. 
High-speed vehicles are often difficult to handle due to motion blur and rolling shutter. These effects are due to the fact that since the vehicles are moving, the lighter observations become warped, like the camera image on the left, making it difficult to predict where the object is at a specific point in time. Furthermore, in the real world, we cannot always expect messages to arrive with perfect timestamps. It's important that V2V communication is robust to delayed messages. Here, our proposed V2V net is much more robust than the other fusion alternatives. In this evaluation, we account for time delay in the output fusion by extrapolating the vehicle trajectories, but no compensation is done for lighter fusion as extrapolating lighter point clouds is non-trivial. We therefore can see large gains made in V2V in improving PNP performance. So now I'll pass it on to James, who will provide further exploration into making V2V robust to localization errors. Thanks. Hi, my name is James and I'm a research scientist at Wabi. I'll be talking about how to improve V2V by correcting pose noises that occur from localization errors. The amazing performance and benefits of V2V net can be quickly diminished in the presence of localization noise of any vehicle in the V2V network. In the real world, imperfect localization can be very common across many different localization methods. We've seen that V2V net is able to achieve significant perception and prediction improvements by fusing information from other SDVs in the network. Information in the form of intermediate neural network representations are fused by a spatially aware graph neural network. When performing spatial aggregation of the incoming messages, localization error causes the warp messages to be misaligned, which significantly detriments downstream perception and prediction performance. And this is especially true for heading errors, as absolute displacement errors are scaled up as we get further away from the sensor. So even a small amount of heading noise can result in large displacements at long range. Towards synchronizing the poses of different incoming messages, a traditional approach for point clouds is point cloud registration, where alignment is done by registering correspondences in point cloud geometry. This method has more recently been extended to let neural networks learn from data and predict registrations instead of using heuristics. However, as we are working in the feature space, these methods are not applicable. In a more general approach to transformation synchronization, there is a line of work which formulates the set of misaligned measurements as a graph, where each measurement is a node. Then, each edge is a relative transform or correspondence mapping. The algorithms here iteratively refine the edges until the best global agreement is achieved. More recently, extensions to this formulation have been proposed with neural networks. In this work, the graph has weighted edges since not all estimates of correspondences are equally reliable. And therefore, a neural network predicts the weighting of these edges. Then, the algorithm alternates between updating the correspondences and the edge weightings until converging to a good global solution. Finally, another line of work formulates the set of relative transforms as a matrix. Intuitively, since the solution has all measurements aligned to the same pose, this will be a low rank matrix. Then we are given a few sparse measurements that are corrupted with noise and potentially some outliers. And the problem can be formulated as low rank matrix recovery. We propose a cooperative correction framework with three steps. First, we use a pulse regression module that considers the ego message and each warp message to predict a... We propose a cooperative correction framework with three steps. First, we use a pulse regression module that considers the ego message and each warp incoming message to predict a correct relative pose between the two vehicles. However, Regressing individual poses may lead to inconsistent beliefs between different pairs of SDVs. Therefore, we aim to refine the relative poses and propose to push the agents to come to a consensus about each other's poses using a novel, robust synchronization algorithm. 
Concretely, we use the conditional Markov random field where each vehicle's pose is a node. We then condition on the predicted relative poses during optimization. After the vehicles reach a consensus about the poses, there may still be outliers poisoning the message. Given a refined warp message and the ego message, we predict an attention weight for that incoming message. These weights are then passed into V2V Net's graph neural network along with the feature maps. During graph neural network message passing, each message is weighted according to the predicted attention weights. By doing this, outlier messages will have a very low weighting and will be discarded when aggregated by the GMM. We compare our method against a few baselines, the standard V2V net without any correction. And we also compare against a single vehicle perception model, which we denote as no fusion. We also compare against V2V net trained against pose noise, which we denote as data augmentation. And we compare against learn to sync a state-of-the-art synchronization algorithm, which was presented previously. First, observe that without any correction, V2V communication quickly degrades to being worse than not having any communication at all. With our proposed method, we see nearly constant perception and prediction performance for noise seen in the training set, which is up to 0.4 meter standard deviation for positional noise and four degrees for heading. We also evaluate performance against noise greater than that seen during training, and we still see reliable performance of our model for these larger amounts of noise. Thanks for listening, and this concludes our session on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication for self-driving. Hi. Hi, my name is Siva. So if anyone has any questions about V2V, uh, James and I are here to answer any questions that we can. Uh, yeah, and then the next session up is data sets and metrics. Cool. So anyways, we're uh, still, uh, we're now on track in our schedule. So we'll keep the remaining three minutes as a break. And then we'll start at 155 for the data sets and metrics session. So feel free to stretch your legs and uh, take a break while we wait until uh, 155 to start. Thanks. Thanks guys for attending.
uh, James, I think there is now a question in the Zoom chat, if you have time. Um, is there any mechanism to correct or filter bad measurements made by the other vehicles? Or do you measure the consistency between all measurements obtained from the other cars? Sorry, um, can you repeat that? Sure, yeah. So is there any mechanism to correct or filter bad measurements made by the other vehicles? Or do you measure consistency between all measurements obtained from the other cars? Yeah, so um, I guess kind of. So um, for the consistency, it's all relative. So I guess if every vehicle has the same biased error, then um, it will be fine. But um, if in other, otherwise, then no, there's no mechanism, mechanism to correct like bad measurements. Um, or sorry, sorry, the answer is yes. Um, Basically what happens is like the host, the Eagle vehicle receives a bunch of measurements from the other vehicles. So um, like during aggregation, if something's misaligned, like the relative pose is off by a little bit, um, that would be the error. And then the error correction, like the pose correction would correct it. Um, yeah. Cool. And I think, to, oh, like, sorry. Go ahead. Add measurements on the hardware. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think also related to this is that uh, we uh, you you'll be, we'll see in the adversarial uh, ML section later on additional approaches for handling like adversarial attacks in a V two V setting, which might help also try to correct for like these bad measurements by just being robust to them. Yeah, and then there's one more question in the YouTube uh, chat is is there any assumption in V two V on the closeness of the point clouds being fused? Um, so there is somewhat of an implicit assumption that there is overlap in the point clouds. So usually the point clouds, the vehicles need to be like around, since the LiDAR sensors on a, on a vehicle STV are around maybe a hundred meters in range, you want your, uh, uh, vehicles to have at least maybe like say 70 meters or 80 meters or uh, away from each other. That way, when you try to get the point clouds transformed into the same coordinate frame, there is some overlap so that you see cars in the same area. Uh, otherwise, if you see, if two vehicles are too far away, then you could still transmit, but it's still then each vehicle basically doing independent PNP and then just communicating ahead of time, hey, there's a car coming up in like 200, 300 meters from now. But you can't really leverage, I guess, the uh, shared computation or um, shared uh, data. Yeah, so I guess like if they're too far apart, you can't do like cooperative perception. But I guess the advantage then is that like, like we have a hard time perceiving like like way too far away, like two hundred mm -hmm. meters away. There would be no lighter points. So in that case, like if the other vehicle can just send you its, its detections, you can like you know increase your perception range significantly like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely would be helpful for planning. Cool. I think now we are ready to go. Uh, to the next session, it is at metrics. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Seiko, a research scientist at WAPI. In this section, we'll take a step back and review a few crucial components to a machine learning development workflow, datasets, dataset curation, and evaluation. As we've seen in the past sections, self-driving systems rely heavily on data-hungry machine learning models. But model development and training is only one step of a traditional workflow. First, raw data must be collected. Then a subset of the data is selected via dataset curation and sent to labeling to create high quality training datasets. Finally, models can be trained on these datasets. After training, we must evaluate the performance of the model. In practice, this is an iterative process and every step of the workflow can be adapted based on current model performance. In this section, we'll take a deeper look at three steps of this process. First, we'll review self-driving datasets. Then we'll look at the process, how these datasets can be curated. Finally, we'll review how the trained models are evaluated. Let's begin by discussing self-driving datasets. Self-driving is an extremely complex task with many sub-problems and high-level approaches. Therefore, there are many different self-driving datasets and the best dataset will pretend on the particular use case. For every dataset, there are a few properties we must consider. 
First, there are the sensors used to collect the data set. These vary significantly and have a large impact on model performance and the difficulty of the task. Second, high definition maps can provide useful supervision or priors for many tasks. Some datasets contain no maps, while others contain detailed map information. Traffic light information and temporary construction elements are also useful. Third, supervised machine learning models are as good as the data on which they are trained. Therefore, the types of annotations, quantity, and quality of the data set will also be of huge importance. Finally, as we will discuss in more detail later, data set curation techniques can be applied to ensure that the examples in the data set are more interesting and or cover the set of real world scenarios. This coverage is crucial to ensure that models generalize to the real world distribution. Here's a rough timeline of various self-driving datasets. As you can see, there's been growing interest in self-driving research in datasets in recent years. Let's start by taking a look at some perception datasets. Sensors are critical to these datasets since they are the raw inputs to the model. In this setting, maps can provide useful priors as input or can be used to supervise online mapping tasks. Annotations vary from dataset to dataset, specifically in terms of the granularity we want to label. Bounding boxes can be used for detection, whereas point information is captured by semantic and instant segmentation. Finally, perception datasets can vary in difficulty based on how they are curated. Some contain challenging weather conditions or nighttime scenes. The geographic diversity can also affect the difficulty of the task. Kitty was the first public data set intended for the application of vision in robotics and specifically autonomous driving. The data was captured by driving around in rural areas and highways. It consists of one and a half hours of data from multiple cameras, a Validine 3D LiDAR, and accurate localization data estimated from RTK GPS and IMU. Such a collection of sensor data enabled the research on many canonical tasks in vision and robotics, including stereo matching, optical flow, 3D visual odometry, SLAM, and 3D object detection. While it has been key to progress in self-driving research, for certain tasks there exist modern, larger datasets. The Cityscapes dataset was specifically targeted for the task of semantic understanding of images in the context of self-driving. The data was collected in 50 cities covering spring, summer, and fall, although not in adverse weather. High quality pixel labels are provided for 5,000 images and coarse annotations for 20,000 more images. These annotations are highly useful for semantic and instant segmentation, but unfortunately the dataset is less applicable for other self-driving tasks. The Deep Drive dataset consists of 100,000 videos of driving that are crowdsourced. It covers four different cities, has balanced day and night data, and extreme weather conditions such as snow and rain. One benefit of this data set is that it contains annotations for a variety of tasks, including bounding boxes, lane markings, drivable areas, and semantic segmentation. The data includes camera images, IMU, and GPS, but unfortunately lacks 3D sensors. Audi released an autonomous driving data set, A2D2, which includes synchronized images and 3D point clouds, as well as other vehicle data. With multiple cameras and LiDARs on board vehicle, they provide a full 360 degree coverage surrounding the SDV. Unfortunately, bounding boxes are only labeled for non-sequential frames, preventing the dataset from being used for tracking or motion forecasting. Now we will move on to a set of datasets that are more applicable for the motion forecasting task. For this task, sensor, are only required for joint perception and prediction models. The presence of maps are extremely important as they provide strong priors, especially for long horizon and goal-based prediction. For annotations, we must consider three factors. First, the sequence length of each snippet determines the maximal prediction horizon. Second, the quality of the labels is crucial for learning. Some datasets forgo high quality human labels or automatic labels from a perception system. While these labels may be noisier, they tend to provide large scale annotations required to capture the long tail of driving behavior. Finally, curation is an important aspect of motion forecasting datasets. Ideally, datasets are constructed so that they contain interesting and interactive behaviors to predict. ATG4D 
was one of the first large-scale datasets for prediction with over 40 hours of human annotated bounding boxes. The dataset is curated manually to contain safety critical situations. The dataset also includes rich HD maps with semantic information, including lane connectivity information, intersections, crosswalks, and traffic lights. In each LiDAR and image frame, all the visible vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists are labeled using high quality 3D and 2D bounding boxes. Also, each object has a unique identifier that allows tracking objects throughout the entire sequence. While the dataset is very large, it is smaller than modern auto-labeled motion forecasting datasets. The new scenes dataset is collected by a sensor suite that covers 360 degrees around the vehicle. The 1,000 scenes in the dataset are manually selected to include high traffic density, rare classes, dangerous situations, and diverse maneuvers. This dataset is the first SDV dataset that includes radar data in addition to cameras, LiDAR, and maps. Similar to AT-G4D, this dataset provides 3D bounding boxes for visible objects in the scene, which makes it useful for 3D detection and prediction tasks. Unfortunately, the dataset is relatively small for motion forecasting. Waymo has released multiple datasets. Its first dataset, the Waymo Open Dataset, consists of driving sequences, which include six and a half hours of LiDAR, camera, and pose information. The sensor configuration additionally includes multiple LiDARs. While this dataset contains annotation for both perception and motion forecasting, it has limited applicability for the latter task due to its size and lack of HD maps. The recently released Pandaset contains high quality sensor data for multiple LiDAR sensors and five cameras. This data is annotated with 3D bounding boxes and detailed semantic segmentation labels for a subset of the dataset. Unfortunately, the dataset contains does not contain HD maps, and the short eight second snippets limit the prediction horizon that can be used for motion forecasting. Argoverse recently released two datasets, one for detection and tracking, and another for motion forecasting. The motion forecasting dataset is mined for interesting trajectories, including those at intersections, turning, and lane changing. The dataset also includes HD map information and is relatively large scale. Unfortunately, the labels for the motion forecasting data set come from perception output and can therefore be noisy, making it difficult to train models. Lyft recently released a very similar data set designed solely for motion forecasting. The data set is the largest public prediction data set with over 100,000 hours of data. Sorry, 1,000 hours of data. The data is also paired with HD maps useful for prediction. Unfortunately, the data was collected in a limited geographic region covering only 15 kilometers of unique roads. The labels are also from a perception system and can therefore be noisy. Finally, Waymo also released a similar data set designed for interactive motion forecasting. While the data set is smaller in terms of length, the labels are generated by an off-board perception system, which leverages information across time to produce better auto labels. Each of the 100 thousand scenarios in the data set is also mined specifically to contain an interaction between two actors in the scene. The data set is also more geographically diverse. Lastly, we will provide brief overview of localization data sets. Localization data sets require sensor data, calibration information, and high quality ground truth poses. Maps are typically used to compute the ground truth poses but may not be present in the dataset itself. Unlike perception and prediction datasets, manual annotations are not required, so these datasets can scale more easily. Finally, curation focuses on selecting longer sequences than motion forecasting datasets. The Kitty odometry dataset, part of the Kitty Vision benchmark suite, is perhaps one of the most widely used datasets for autonomous vehicle localization. The dataset covers a diverse range of environments, including urban, residential, and highway scenarios over 22 seconds. However, it does not cover different seasons, bad weather, or low light conditions. The dataset contains multiple sensors, including 64 beam LiDAR and stereo cameras, and has been widely used in robotics research. However, the total scale of the benchmark is relatively limited at 40 kilometers, and the cameras are only facing forward, limiting research in multi-view SLAM. The Oxford Robot Car dataset is another highly popular dataset 
for autonomous vehicle localization and mapping. It contains a thousand kilometers of driving over a hundred sequences covering the same route in Oxford over the course of nearly one and a half years. While the geographic extent of the data set is more limited than Kitty, it exhibits much more variation in terms of environmental changes, including rain, fog, snow, con and construction, as well as having nighttime driving. This makes this benchmark particularly useful for evaluating long-term localization and mapping. The sensor platform uses a triple LiDAR setup, and there are cameras facing both forwards and backwards. Unlike Kitty, the dataset was extended with data from a Naptec FMCV scanning radar, making it useful for researching localization under adverse weather conditions. We have re recently reduced PIT30M, a dataset for large scale localization tailored for self driving applications. We were motivated by the lack of a public localization benchmark that is large scale, diverse, and provides accurate ground truth localization. We collected PIT30M with over 1,300 trips and over 14 months and include over 30 million images and LiDAR readings. We also carry a consumer grade GPS that we use to study localization bootstrapping. To learn more about PIT30M, check out the localization part of this tutorial. In recent perception data sets, the cameras are usually synchronized to the rotating LiDAR and are therefore asynchronous among themselves. To evaluate SLAM systems with multiple asynchronous cameras, we collect and plan to release a new SLAM benchmark. We use a robot platform with seven asynchronous cameras and collect 21 hours of driving covering 482 kilometers in the Pittsburgh area. Compared to existing public SLAM benchmarks, our dataset AMV Bench is large scale covers diverse weather conditions and geographic regions, and is recorded with multiple asynchronous cameras. Here is a visualization of AMV Bench that shows challenging real world conditions such as occlusion, lighting changes, textureless highway driving, shadows and vegetation, and low light scenes. To summarize, we provided an overview of the many self-driving datasets used today. We provided some high level properties to look for across different data sets. We are excited for the next generation of data sets, which we predict will continue to bring improvements to each of these aspects. Next, we'll move on and discuss the process of curating these data sets in more detail. Modern self driving fleets can collect hours of raw data on a daily basis. However, labeling this data with detailed annotations can be prohibitively expensive, and this is therefore a major bottleneck in the development pipeline. This motivates the need for dataset curation, which aims to select the best examples to be labeled. Before discussing dataset creation techniques, we begin with desired properties that we might want to optimize as part of our curation process. First, we might want the dataset to be interesting and contain challenging examples to train the model. Of course, the definition of interesting will change depending on the task, and we will see some examples next. Optimizing for coverage, on the other hand, ensures that the selected subset is representative of the real world distribution, increasing the chance that the models generalize. Finally, given a particular model, we can consider optimizing the dataset itself to further improve model performance. Let's start with approaches that seek to curate an interesting data set. A common technique to curate interesting data sets is to define log metadata, or tags, which can be used to retrieve interesting examples for a given task. Importantly, the tagging process must be fully automated and should not rely on human labeling, since our goal is to tag all the collected data and use the information to select the interesting examples for labeling. At a high level, there are two approaches to tagging self-driving logs, rules-based tagging and learning to tag. Let's begin by discussing the rules-based pipeline. Rules-based tagging leverages an off-board perception system on raw sensor data or the cached outputs from the onboard perception, perception system. And together with the SDV pose and HD map, reasons about various attributes of the scene. 
In this pipeline, an engineer must write custom logic to define each tag as a function of the detections, pose, and map given as input. This pipeline is used in a recent work, Diverse Complexity Measures for Dataset Creation and Self-Driving, which defines a comprehensive set of tags or complexity measures, which we will review next. The complexity measures introduced cover a wide range of scene attributes. First, they seek to characterize the complexity of the map, taking into account the complexity of the motion paths, lane crossings, crosswalks, intersections, traffic controls, and map height. Please refer to the paper for mathematical definitions of each measure. In this example, we can see that abnormal intersections are tagged as more complex than traditional intersections. The complexity of the actors in the scene can be estimated based on the object detections over a period of time. Actor complexity can be measured by estimating whether actors were static or dynamic based on the class diversity within the scenario, the spatial diversity, and each actor's velocity and path complexity. Here, we see a scene tagged with high actor complexity as one with many pedestrians shown as pink circles. Finally, measures were also proposed to characterize the complexity of the self-driving vehicle's behavior. These measures take into account the complexity of its driving path, velocity, diversity, its high-level route, and interactions with both traffic controls and other actors. Rules-based tagging relies on noisy outputs from a perception system and requires extensive engineering effort to define logic for each tag of interest. Instead of relying on this pipeline, recent work proposes to directly learn to tag attributes of a self-driving scene from supervision. Once the module is trained, it can be run on newly collected logs and produce a diverse set of scene tags automatically without requiring any human effort. At a high level, the proposed module takes both a rasterized HD map and sensor data over a period of time as input and passes it through a CNN to produce a spatiotemporal embedding. The network jointly learns a tag attribute embedding for each of the supported tag types. For example, given a tag attribute like left turn, we can look up its corresponding row in the learnable matrix A to obtain its embedding. Then, the two embedding representations are combined through an element-wise dot product, preserving the spatiotemporal dimensions and returning a tensor of tag values. This approach is trained end-to-end -to, -end to minimize a supervised query loss, using a variety of techniques to ensure learning is balanced across all tag attributes. This architecture is experimentally validated by learning to tag 15 common attributes of the self-driving scene simultaneously, including those relating to actor density, vehicle density, interactions, and the map's topology. Here we see examples of qualitative scene tags produced by the model, given only raw sensor data shown on the left and the HD maps, not the actor bounding boxes shown for visualization purposes only. Finally, once we have produced a set of tags for the collected data, the final step is to use the tags to select a data set. The first option is to leverage compositional SQL-like queries to retrieve relative scenarios to be labeled. This type of approach is briefly described to create both the Argoverse and recent Waymo motion forecasting data sets. Alternatively, if tag values are continuous and represent complexity scores, Examples can be retrieved by solving an optimization problem, for example, maximizing the complexity of the selected subset. Selecting only challenging or interesting examples can lead to a biased data set, which ignores common but less interesting scenarios. For machine learning systems to generalize, it is also critical that the curated data set is representative of the real world distribution. To improve coverage of their selected data set, the same work, Diverse Complexity Measures for Dataset Creation and Self-Driving, adds an additional selection step to select remaining examples to better cover the space of scenarios. First, they quantize the dissimilarity between snippets as a function of their difference in the tag values. In order to account for geodiversity, the authors expand the complexity vectors with the latitude and longitude coordinates of the frames. Then they iteratively look for a snippet that is furthest from the current selected set and add that to the set to be labeled. The experiments in the paper showcase that optimizing dataset 
curation for both interestingness and coverage leads to improved metrics across a variety of self-driving tasks and self-driving models. We've seen that optimizing for interestingness and coverage can lead to significant improvements across a set of models and self-driving tasks. Now, given a particular model, it's natural to ask whether we can further optimize examples to directly improve its performance. This is actually a well-known machine learning research problem known as active learning. The approach iteratively leverages the current trained model to decide which examples to label next based on those believed most likely to improve the model's performance. Directly optimizing the expected improvement of a model can be very challenging. Therefore, it is often approximated by, rel by related objectives, such as selecting examples with high model uncertainty. Within the self-driving industry, multiple companies have mentioned that active learning is a core component of their development approach. In Tesla's Autonomy Day presentation, they mention automated triggers which identify examples to be sent to labeling to improve the system. Cruz has also published a blog post on how they leverage the consistency of predictions over time to mine hard examples. Within the research community, active learning has been studied in the context of 2D object detection, showcasing that actively selecting examples based on model disagreement leads to a boost in detection performance of vulnerable road users in nighttime conditions. Active learning for perception and prediction introduces a unique set of challenges and opportunities. First, each scene contains many annotations and the labeling cost tends to scale linearly with the number of annotations required. As a consequence, we noticed that certain regions within the scene can be uninformative and expensive, while others may be more interesting yet incur relatively low cost. Therefore, this motivates the need for a new active selection method, which is both cost aware and supports fine grain selection. Motivated by these challenges, a recent work proposes an active learning framework for perception and prediction, which proposes to train PNP models from partial supervision to enable fine grained active selection. Rather than score entire scenes, the proposed approach scores each region in the scene and selects only the best to be sent to labeling. In the paper's experiments, they show that not only does this active selection lead to improved prediction metrics, but it also translates to significant improvements in downstream motion planning, outperforming, random selection, and common active learning baselines. To summarize, we have reviewed three approaches to curating self-driving data sets. Of course, there is no one approach that is best, and a combination of these is likely required to ensure a dataset covers the long tail of examples required to train robust self-driving models. Let's move on to the final part of this talk, where we will briefly discuss how to evaluate trained models. The simplest approach to evaluating trained models is to follow standard practice in supervised machine learning and evaluate the model on a held out test data set, unused for training. Train and test data sets can additionally be geographically split where no examples are within the same geographic region to ensure the model does not overfit to a particular region. Given the data set, we can compute task specific module metrics. Please see the other sections of this tutorial for more details on commonly used metrics for each task. This approach is simple and enables fast model development as metrics are easy to compute and only require a separate held out data set. However, this type of evaluation has many drawbacks. First, many metrics typically measure the performance of an independent module and may not capture the effects on the overall system's performance. As an example, an increase in MAP on detection task may not necessarily translate to significant improvements of the self-driving system. Second, since data sets are static, they do not fully capture the real world driving setting. This only allows the system to be evaluated in open loop, which is different from the real world closed loop setting. Let's take a deeper look at open loop versus closed loop evaluation. 
open loop evaluation runs the entire pipeline to compute the control of the self-driving vehicle, but never executes the command. Since the self-driving vehicle does not interact with the environment, we can easily run open loop evaluation on past data and compute a variety of metrics. However, this type of evaluation completely ignores the sequential nature of the self-driving problem, since the STV's actions are never executed. As a consequence, the distribution of states that STV encounters in the real world may differ significantly from the distribution used in evaluation. Road testing, on the other hand, executes the STV's control command at each time step, and therefore past actions can influence the future states that the STV visits. This is the real world setting that we would like our STV to operate within. However, when models are still under development, this can be unsafe as the learned model's behavior can be unpredictable. It can also be prohibitively expensive since extensive driving is required to achieve statistical significance as rare challenging events occur infrequently in the real world. This motivates the need for closed loop simulation for evaluation. This approach is safe and provides the added flexibility to target safety critical situations. However, for the evaluation to be close to the real world setting, a high fidelity simulator is needed, which can accurately model the real world. This is a major area of research and will be covered extensively in the next section. This concludes the talk. To summarize what we've seen, in this section, we took a deeper look at three components of self-driving development workflow, datasets, dataset curation, and evaluation. Thanks for listening. Cool. So uh, that was uh, data sets and metrics. The next session will be on simulation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask Sean, who's online. Uh, may I ask one question? Yeah, of course. Uh, so about tag the data set, um, so, uh, so, uh, do just, uh, in this project, do we, uh, tag the wine land, uh, so consider a weather just foggy or snowy. So how do we detect the wine land in this situation? Thank you. So the question was how we tag um, weather as well to retrieve interesting scenarios. Uh, uh, actually, the wine land. Uh, just the car, just like you need to detect the wine land on the on the road, right? And then you have the car that driving in between each wine land something. So do you need yeah, to tag the, the lane detection? doing yeah. wind detection in bad weather? Yes, yes. Okay. Is, is there any data sets that you know of, Sean, that does, I guess, have like uh, the task of lane detection or like doing, estimating the graph of online map, I guess, for in with data sets with bad weather too, I guess. Yeah, so I think the deep drive uh, data set has the lane um, detection task and I believe it's covered with some pretty diverse um, weather conditions. I'm not sure if there are how many examples there are that contain really tough uh, weather conditions, but um, if I remember correctly, there's definitely a diversity of different types of weather within that data set. So I think that would be a good uh, one to look at. And yeah, I think to just answer more generally, we can, this is a place where tagging can be used and data set curation to, um, if we have these tags, which I think you can get from weather APIs and um, other approaches, then you could curate a data set, particularly with, with bad weather, and annotate only those with the lane markings. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. We have one more question. This one's a little bit harder, actually. Uh, how far can open loop systems get you before you need to switch to closed loop systems? How do you decide when you're ready to move to the more expensive closed loop evaluation? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, um, it's pr pretty tough to give like a definitive answer. I think um, uh, from, from my experience, I think that uh, closed loop evaluation is pretty important um, from, from early on, just because of the issues that we discussed. Uh, it really is, uh, seems like a, a very different setting to be evaluating your model in. So I think closed loop evaluation is, is pretty critical. And you mentioned that uh, the, the closed loop setting is more expensive, but I think that um, that may not necessarily be the case in a simulation. If you've uh, you know, done, uh, have, have a good closed loop simulator, uh, I think there are ways that it could be um, not necessarily very expensive. The road testing approach is definitely uh, very expensive, but if you have a good simulator, I think you could um, evaluate in closed loop very early on. Great, thanks, Sean. And hopefully we can see some of the examples of simulation in the next uh, session and how much it costs to run some of these systems. And I, I think before we have the, that next session, we'll have like a 10 minute break and we'll start at 2.40 for simulation. <laughs>